Hey, everyone. All right. I hope you've had a nice week. Does anybody have any good plans for, for Thanksgiving or is it just everyone's already at home and nothing changes? It's just going to smell like turkey and ham instead of Hot Pockets or whatever. Who cares? <laughs> All right. Um, we'll, we'll get started. And the, so we'll just sort of pick up, we'll, we'll like race through these things. Just remember when the um, the exam is coming up, it's, it's a week from today the exams a week from today and the assignments you know that uh, you know again November 20th everything sort of due uh, where to find the take-home exam and all of the different statistical models that we've gone through and then where to find them right these are the ex this is the time stamp in those lectures of exactly where you can find those statistical models pull up the chat box in case you have comments and for today there's nothing that's going to be on the exam. This is just try to incorporate as much of this feedback on how to write, how to communicate, uh, use of language, abuses of language, and what clarity looks like and, and not misusing some of the words or truncating words where they shouldn't be truncated and, and just, you know, this stuff, right? We, we talked about this a little bit before my uh, carbon monoxide detectors were going off, but, but speak clearly, communicate, communicate clearly and don't do gibberish when clarity will suffice. Uh, consider your audience and speak to the audience. Uh, to answer these things and the analogy I always give right, is, is in music where where only the untalented people do the ridiculous showing off right the the self-satisfying solos and and like the thing where you cross one hand over the other when you're playing piano sort of unnecessarily look how talented I am but nobody cares all anyone wants is a nice simple melody all anyone wants is the Beatles are the equivalent of the Beatles, whatever contemporary equivalent is, where it's simple, clear melodies with clear communication. Um, we'll, with the exam, we'll talk about that. We'll have a review day. I'm looking at the comments. We'll have a review day for the exam after this on Wednesday. We'll do a review for the exam. But just make sure that science isn't a language of exclusion, that you're able to relay your information, right? Your baseball signs, useful. You don't want, you don't want the opposing fielders to know exactly what the batter is going to do. You're going to lose the game if they do. Morse code uh, or any other type of military, uh, you know, covert anything. Yeah, if it's covert, you don't want your opponents, you don't want your enemies to know what you're doing because then they will respond, they will counter and you lose your war and all the socially sanctioned killing is, is, is uh, you know, negated. Uh, anywhere you go, exclusion tends to be a bad thing, right? Exclusion tends to be a bad thing. Now, we look at these clubs and whether it's fraternities, sororities, or these um, country clubs and all these, exclusion is what people do in life. And it just doesn't take much thought. It only takes a moment of reflection to realize that all of them are pretty creepy. And so, you know, this is, you know, again, going back to, to lecture two, like the Berenstein Bears, I grew up with that. And I sort of grew up with, with Family Guy. It came out when I was in high school, if that can be counted as growing up. That's the later formative years. But, you know, this, this no girls allowed stuff, it sounds almost fine when somebody says it and moves on. But again, I'll say the you know, last time, if you replace the word girls with a race, right, then immediately you recognize how sort of wretched this this is and, and how horrible this is. And, and almost anything of exclusion, if you're trying to exclude somebody, even if it's just in communication, in language, in the, the uh, you know, biomechanist, or statisticians or whatever parlance, if you work in a particular field and you communicate it in a way that only people in that field know what you're talking about, you're losing a great deal of your audience 
and it's your fault, right? It's not their fault for being excluded. It's your fault for excluding them. So wherever possible, be as inclusive as you can. So open up those gates on, on whatever it is, whatever subject you're talking about. Now in every field, there's you know, like talk shop, right? Where even if it's just some particular sport, there's going to be a lot of language that's involved in that sport. And that's okay, right? There's when I talk about a negative binomial regression or something like that, okay, well, it, things have names and you have to introduce those names. But as you do so, consider your audience. Consider your audience when you are communicating anything of value. If what you're saying is of no value, mumble and use just gibberishy nonsense, totally fine. But if you have something of value to say, make sure you say it in a decipherable way. Um, so Steven Pinker, he's this linguist, psychologist, writer, once upon a time professor, I don't know if he still teaches, but you know, anyone who has read an inept student paper, a bad Google translation, or an interview with George W. Bush can appreciate that standards of usage are desirable in many arenas of communication. They can lubricate comprehension, reduce misunderstanding, provide a stable platform for the development of style and grace and signal that the writer has exercised care in crafting a passage, or if it's a present presentation that the presenter has has worked through this a little bit that it's not a rough draft one of the most insulting things that you can do to your listener or your reader or whatever your audience your viewer whatever it is whatever your audience consists of one of the worst most insulting things you can do to them is give them a rough draft right now when when a writer gives out you know, it needs beta readers. Like they have some novel they're working on and they have beta readers. That's not a rough draft, right? That's probably been edited 40 times already. And that's like the 40th version. And then they're, they're soliciting feedback. There's going to be no grammar errors. The language is going to be totally fine. But they're looking for, wow, this kind of came out of surprise. You know, that I, I wasn't expecting this. And I was a little bit disappointed because the promises you established in chapter one weren't met. You just sort of turned this corner in this unexpected way. I was hoping to know what was coming. That's what beta readers are for. That's what you know, your quote rough draft is doing when other people read it. You've already gone through all of this effort of 40 revisions or 60 revisions. These are normal numbers that you'll encounter. Uh, in the professional world, right, if you're going to actually publish something real, as opposed to just you know, write an email or, or post something on social networking, you're looking at 40 to 60 revisions where you like just totally rewrite the thing 60 times bef before anyone else is, before an editor is even willing to see it, you know, the 10th revision or something. And because there, there comes a point where you submit something to an editor and then if you're still going to make changes, the editor is going to be pissed at you. Like if you're still going to be changing things. And so you better submit sort of the final draft the best you can do to the editor. And if the editor looks at what is inferior work where it is you're it's possible that you could improve it that don't hand it to that person whenever you do vo2 max testing on somebody you make them do this exertional run on a treadmill and you want to get them as as exhausted as max vo2 max right the maximum oxygen consumption and you always ask them they're like i can't go anymore and they straddle the treadmill and they're sort of breathing heavily oh, i just couldn't go another step and then you wait like 30 seconds and you ask them, do you, do you think you could have gone like, a, you know, another minute or 30 seconds or even like 10 seconds? Yeah, I guess I could have. That's usually what people do in life. We quit early. We quit with inferior work and those people never go pro. Um, whatever it is that you want to accomplish in life, you're not going to succeed if you cut yourself short because you're cutting your audience short. And it's so disrespectful to the audience. Think about musicians who say things like, Oh, you know, I don't care what anyone else thinks. I write these songs for me. Why don't you just spit in your audience's face? Just spit in their eyes and, and on their cheeks and stuff. You're not going to sell albums that way. We all care what others think. Otherwise, you wouldn't do it in the first place. There's enough psychology and marketing research in, in these domains that it's not anything particularly, you know, dangerous that I'm saying here. We, we market things. And in order to succeed in life, we have to do that. And uh, communication, clarity, revision, these are so critical to your success. So earlier I talked about there being a few pillars of 
of you know, rising through the ranks in a profession. Let's say you want to be physical therapists, you want to be MDs or DOs, you want to be physician's assistants, you want to be clinical researchers or any clinical field, you want to work in academia, whatever it is that you want to do there's a next step. You haven't arrived, right? There's, I haven't arrived. I'm 40 years old and I'm, I'm in this professional role. I haven't arrived yet. If I get to the end of a year and I don't you know, look over my shoulder, I'm like, oh, I could have done better. Now I know more than I did when I was 39. I'm failing, right? You have to continue to make progress in life. Every single year, you should make progress. And the three most important things for you at this point to be making progress in are... GPA in terms of a quantitative stamp of uh, ability, right? What's your GPA? That matters for getting into graduate school. That matters not really for securing a job, but for getting into graduate school, that matters. Publications. If for, for getting into graduate school and getting a job. For getting a job, publications are way more important than a GPA, way more important. They're not even in the same league. Um, I mean, these are completely different worlds. Nobody, your employer isn't gonna care what your GPA is. Your employer is gonna care if you've, if you've changed the landscape of your field, if you've changed thinking, if you've changed clinical practice, whatever it is. If people are citing your work for why they're doing some intervention or I'm doing my modalities or whatever it is and, and they're citing you that matters you get the job you get the raise you get partner at the firm or whatever it is and so publications getting into graduate school gpa matters a little bit more than publications and getting careers publications matter more and the third which matters just as much as both of those uh it matters way more than both of those if you're bad at it is clarity of communication clarity and how articulate you are in your communication if if you say things like um, let me read to you a quote. If that doesn't ring with a cringe, right? Because there's a grammatical error in that. I'm gonna I'm gonna read a quote to you. That's a grammatical error. Um, or if you say like, oh, well, let me send you the invite. And again, people are going to cringe who are fluent in English, and you're not going to get the job. You're not. You, so you have to be articulate. If if you are communicating through cliches, people are going to uh, respond to your communication with cringes. You want to avoid that, right? So clarity of communication. That's one in our stool, right? Our not like our feces, but our but our like you know bar stool. The three prongs, the three legs are going to be GPA or, or quantitative academic performance and publications, contribution to a field, scientific advancement of a field, and then communication. That's the third. Communication, I'm not going to test you on. You aren't going to have an exam where, where I'm talking about communication. But if you start making these errors and I'm reading your poster, I mean, come on, I explained that one in the, you know, if you, if you make some giant grammatical error that I just was kind of like grinding on the whole time in, in today, and you make that error in your you know, uh, semester long presentation, I'm happy to be annoyed because it just means you didn't listen and didn't try. You didn't try to revise. You didn't listen. So the only place where this could play a part in your semester grade is in your final project. Okay, so let's start. Two thirds, this is me correcting other people's papers. In the future, I guess we're not starting yet. In the future, if you submit to me a paper, I'm going to remove your name, your name will not be any and you make like ridiculous, horrible grammar errors. I'm, I'm not going to put anyone's name in my in my slides, but I might use your sentence and say, here's an example of terrible grammar. And so these are all former students. And so, you know, two thirds of Americans have overweight or obesity. Now think of overweight as an as an adjective, it's, it's describing something. Um, obesity is a noun, you can have a noun, right? you can't have obese, oh, that person has obese. That that doesn't make any sense, right? Obese and tall and, and overweight and short and heavy and light and whatever. Adjectives, you, you don't have an adjective. Um, now in the literature, you'll start to see this and that doesn't mean it's grammatically acceptable. You should be better, right? So maybe let's say 10% of scientific writers are willing to just use overweight uh, as a noun, as something somebody can have. And 
that you should be better than that, right? Don't stoop just because some terrible other writer did it. In the sciences, people aren't actually that good at writing, most of them. There are some scientists who are brilliant writers, the bulk of them don't know how to put a sentence together because they say things like, oh, I don't have time to read fiction, right? But then you see them watching television. What are you talking about? I, I've, I've, I've heard a lot of, of prof you know, professors and other professional researchers say, oh, I don't have time to read fiction. I spend all my time doing nonfiction. And then it's like, oh, did you catch the latest episode of what is the matter with you, you imbecile? Um, so we, in order to improve, even right there, I just, I made an error. The words in order belong in no sentence because I could just say to improve, you can eliminate expressions like in order and it doesn't change the sentence. So to improve, we need to practice. We need exposure to these things and novels. That's where people actually can write well. And so learning to communicate, learning to tell a story, reading novels is very helpful and there's no legitimate, right? You're not going to catch, you know, like, the Stephen Kings of the world using overweight as a noun. It's just embarrassing, don't do it. Now, fun, <laughs> the word fun actually is a noun. Don't use it as an adjective. Things are not fun, you have fun. Fun is something you have. So I went to Disneyland and I had fun. I'm reading the comment box. Um, do you have time for Game of Thrones? Game of Thrones, actually, George R. R. Martin, great writer. Um, reading the books, he actually is talented. In that field, Pat Rothfuss is better, more talented. But I would say George R. R. Martin is probably the second most talented uh, uh, crafter of, of English, makes you know, the fewest grammatical errors and has the, 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 the best style. Um, okay, so fun is a, is a noun. That's that's something you have. And going back to this idea of thanks for the invite, that doesn't make sense because the word invitation exists. Invitation is a noun. Invite is a verb. You invite somebody with an invitation. So never never use invite right as anything other than a verb because it just sounds like you don't speak English, right? It, it sounds like and it's okay if English is your second language, and and you heard you know, illiterate people use this expression, totally fine. But, but if you're going to try to get jobs and, and get raises and, and promotions and, and succeed in, in, you know, a higher tax bracket, invitation is the noun. And you'll see in the literature, measure versus measurement, right? We know what this is. You measure a measurement. Measure is the verb. Measurement is the noun. Don't use it the other way, but this one's excusable, right? Sometimes it just takes uh, uh, months and years and decades and of, of use before these deviations of, of language become standard usage. And measure as a noun is sort of acceptable. I'll excuse it. I will excuse measure as a noun because I even like SPSS uses it. Uh, this one is so ubiquitous in the in the literature, in scientific literature as a noun. And maybe, I don't know the reason, maybe it's just because abstracts, you only get 250 words or 300 words or some specific amount of characters. It depends on the publication. And our, how do we start, how do we start saving words? Well, let's circumcise a noun and just pretend the verb form is a noun. We, we, we save a little extra flesh in the maybe. Okay, maybe that's it. But this one, this is excusable, that one. But think about nobody would use this. Hey, what you doing this afternoon? Oh, I'm just taking down the Halloween decorates. Nobody would say that, right? It's decoration. You decorate decorations. You invite with an invitation. And so we have verb forms and we have noun forms. Otherwise stuff starts to get ugly. English just becomes this, this pop marked sort of ugly language when you say, what are you doing? Well, I'm building a building. You know, it just starts to sound stupid. Planting plants, you know, and, and so it's it's helpful for, for matters of communication, for matters of clarity, for matters of of aesthetics to have verb forms and noun forms and not just make them both be the exact same thing. Okay, so this is a picture I took of Zelda, uh, the latest one, whatever, the windy one, whatever that is, uh, where it says, the citizens celebrated the king's valor. From then on, their trust and respect for him grew beyond compare. Now notice there's room here 
for additional characters in that sentence. There's room. And compare is a verb. You don't go beyond the verb. You need a noun form there, beyond comparison. You don't, nothing is beyond compare. That doesn't make sense. That's not English. Beyond comparison is what it has to be, beyond the noun. And, and I think where this really got popular, where this really entered uh, common vernacular and, and, and use is in gummy bears. It's, it was gummy bears and ducktails were these old 80s cartoons, the first uh, syndicated cartoons. So they had more profit margin so they could, they could you know, pay for better art. And the, the theme song, the theme song was, you know, gummy bears bouncing here and there and everywhere on high adventure that's beyond compare. And I remember as, as a child thinking it sounded weird. It was catchy and I'd, I'd eat like half a tub of peanut butter while jumping around my uh, living room watching it as a child. But I remember thinking like even then, I just, this sounds weird beyond compare. That just, that doesn't sound like right English, but okay, I'll go with it. Um, until I learned, you know, the language for real. And so comparison, right? You compare is a verb. Comparison is the noun form. And this is probably the biggest abuse is like epic fail. Um, okay, epic is a noun. Epic is a noun. It is a giant poem, right? It's like Beowulf, okay? And you can use, you can use the word epic as an adjective if you're describing a giant poem, Right, like Beowulf or, or, or Gilgamesh or, you know, Homer's or Iliad Odyssey, like, fine, okay. But it, in general, we think of epic as a big noun, it's, it's a big poem, and fail is a verb, right? So this whole thing, this whole thing, we have a noun and then a verb, and none of it makes sense. Both of those words, and it's being used as a complete sentence, and every single word in that sentence is a painful grammatical error. And you don't get to make, all of these are making fun of other people. And you don't get to make fun of other people if you haven't um, successfully graduated fourth grade grammar. You don't get to be the person who's ridiculing others. Uh, so going back to, to the evaluation of, of papers, uh, utilizing, just don't, uh, don't ever, don't use that word, um, utilizing. This falls in line with this trend of, of people. Remember, I had that little child doing the shredding solo up against the Beatles who are like, no, no, we're actually good at music. So we're just going to play songs that people like. Utilize sounds like a child trying to sound smart. You're adding unnecessary syllables, and it doesn't really even mean that. There's uh, Al Franken had, had in one of his earlier books, I think it was Lies and the Lying Liars Who Tell Them. Um, in one of his, his uh, I'm pretty sure it was that book, he, he talked about the word utilize and he's like, you know what, there's, there's a better definition to what utilize means. And it's using something for a purpose other than what it's intended for. So when I was a student at Pacific, I totaled two golf carts. And because I figured out that in one of the golf carts, it was a gas powered one. And you could use two paper clips to override the governor on it to make the thing go five times as fast. You know, the governor would kick out like 10 miles an hour and the engine would just stop. But it has these gas powered engine. I mean, this thing could go really fast if you override the governor. And, and with these two paper clips connecting these things, you could override it. I was utilizing paper clips. Okay, now as a professor, when I'm you know, affixing paper to paper, that's what paper clips are for. I'm using paper clips. Now in life, most people use things. Utilize is just a ridiculous way of adding syllables in a totally gibberish way. And it just makes the speaker sound less intelligent to add those unnecessary syllables. So never use the word utilize unless you are utilizing the word, right? If you're, if you're using it in a, in, a, in a purpose other than how it's intended. intended. So just don't the business speak. There's like all this leadership convention talk is like the worst way that anyone, I need you to utilize your core competencies and integrate efficient synergies. It's a paradigm shift. Don't say stuff like that, right? Just never say stuff like that. And then other uh, elongated words where you're just stretching the syllables out for no reason. Remember measure is okay in the place of measurement. I don't really like it, but I get that you're, you are, um, sort of contracting it if you're if you're protracting the, the word right terminate you mean stop right or it's like I, I need to put an end to again you mean stop one syllable 
will suffice here. Let me ask you to discontinue your behavior. Just say stop, right? That word is much more articulate than discontinue your behavior. And most of these Elizes, um, most of these are, are, are bad. Um, whether it's, I mean, there's some that are okay, categorize, civilize, fossilize, fertilize. These ones are, are fine, but like finalize, you just mean finish. And so don't add extra words, you know, mobilize means move, sedative, uh, okay, that, that's, that's what we mean when we say like a tranquilizer. Because a, a tranquil, think of tranquility, tranquility is like a nice place to be and so you shoot some like roaring lion with a tranquilizer dart or something like you're not giving it this tranquil experience it's a sedative All right so there are words with with real meanings and we should we should make sure that we use the best meaning the most articulate the shortest the briefest the the where nobody gets lost in translation be clear be concise um, and so words like this, you know, inevitably more prone, you can just remove the word inevitably, you know, individuals are more prone, but then we get into this problem of the word individual, which doesn't mean what people really think it means. Um, so people, it's not, it doesn't mean people, right? So people are more prone to falling. That's what this sentence should have said. It sounds, if if you read it without an appreciation for English, it sounds okay. Older individuals are inevitably more prone to falling due to there's so many errors in that sentence. Um, so older individuals, individual implies individuality, right? Implies there's an, there's there's a uniqueness here. There's a unique quality. Um, people, older adults, older populations. That's what you mean, right? Individuals. There's I don't know three billion old people alive. What do you mean individual? Right? It's the opposite of the word. That, that's literally the the opposite of what you're trying to say. And literal is another one. Um, where my use of it there was fine, but figurative is what is what people actually mean when they say literally. I literally shit a brick. Okay. Uh, I, ouch. I don't know. Let's get you to the hospital. Uh, you are just bleeding internally, and you might not live. Um, it, you know, what, whatever people's uh, use of the word literally. And I'm guessing you can't stand Shakespeare since his writing exclusive to Tezans. I don't really like Shakespeare. Yeah, you're right. Shakespeare was, was brilliant in many of his, in much of his communication um, in the imagery. And um, even in Shakespeare's weaker uh, works, um, there was, you know, talking about how his son had died and he's filling these clothes with, with the form just to look upon. I mean, there's beautiful imagery in Shakespeare, but when people talk about him being the best writer of all time, that's silly gibberish because we just have to, we have to pick somebody. Just like we pick Einstein, not even close to true. We have to pick somebody. If you were to put how articulate Oscar Wilde was up against Shakespeare, there's sort of you know, there's sort of no compare, right? There's no comparison uh, between the two, but it's blasphemous to say. So um, there is an exclusivity and there is a time course to, sh to Shakespeare. And, you know, when uh, the... the the pronunciations, you know, assonance, how that works, the pronunciations change over time. So a lot of today's readings of Shakespeare where it's supposed to rhyme, it doesn't, it doesn't rhyme because we don't pronounce it love. And so, and so uh, there is consonants stay the same year to year to year to year. Um, vowels tend to change over time. Uh, just ask anyone in an English accent to pronounce you know, vitamins and, and whatever, all the consonants are the same, but, but the, the vowels change or go to the South and, and ask someone to change your oil. You mean my owl? Uh, and so uh, vowels change, Shakespeare's vowels. Shakespeare is actually closest uh, in his pronunciations to the American Midwest. It had nothing to do with today's English accent, but it was still, uh, there are still deviations from from how the people in the American Midwest speak. Probably the youngest pronunciation of vowels is actually England. Uh, so your, your pronunciation, unless you have an English accent, is older uh, than the English accent that we, that for some reason you see like Game of Thrones and all these old fantasy, where everyone's in an English accent, which makes no sense because that's a very young pronunciation. So um, individuals, just make sure you, you purge uh, words like inevitably and in individuals use the right word. Just say people if people will suffice. 
Now, preventative, that's not a word, right? You'll, you'll hear this again and again and again with, um, you know, preventative, blah, blah, blah. It's, it's become such a common word. There's a Friends episode about supposedly not a word, right? Irregardless, not a word. Neither is preventative, right? Preventive is the word. Preventive is the word because prevent is what you are doing, right? It's not preventate. For preventative to be a word, preventate would have to be the word. And so think about, you know, alternate, alternative, legislate, legislative, speculate, speculative, um, administrate, administrative, innovate, innovative, suggest, suggestive, prevent, preventive. It's not preventative. Um, orientate just isn't a word. I don't know. People keep saying this and using this and writing this. And what, I, what are you talking about? That's not a word. Um, and normalcy, also not a word. Okay, so so Warren G. Harding, I think he's like 29th president, you know, give or take. And he had this campaign of, of return to, to normalcy, right? Pre-World War I life. And even then, everyone's like, you're an idiot. That's not a word. Um, and yet the word caught on, right? It's normality is the word, just like regularity is the word. Regular C is is not a word right regular c is not a word neither is normal c so don't say normal c i encounter it once every few weeks and it's like it's never been good um and <clears throat> normative this is actually okay normative is okay and it just means normal though you're just adding extra syllables but you see it so often and we know what it means that it's just been entered into modern vernacular again languages change at some point let's give it 50 years it's not going to be that much longer and literally is going to be fine to mean figuratively it's already nearly there oh i literally you know jumping through hoops and whatever no you weren't where is the hoop uh and and so it's it's you know i literally uh, you know have like a million people asking me I, this is just all gibberish but it's not going to take very long, but you should always be, I, again, let's go back to Shakespeare. Just ask Shakespeare on this one. It's you, you are so much better received by higher tax brackets, by um, kind of higher job markets, if you are behind the curve on grammar. If Shakespeare cannot can offer us anything other than uh, emotional poetry and imagery, if Shakespeare can offer us, and also like Shakespeare was, he was like a total plagiarist. I mean, there's like everything he wrote, not everything, but like Romeo and Juliet before Romeo and Juliet. He was just sort of taking other people's work and adding poetry to it. That was fine back then. Now you like lose your you know career if you do that. If you were to do what Shakespeare does today, um, of take somebody else's work and just make it more poetic, you would never be hired again, and you. There, there would be like anti you campaigns on, on the internet. But for most areas of life, <clears throat> it's better to be ahead of the curve in things like ethics, especially, you know, ethics and, and um, you know, or technology or it's, it's better to be ahead of the curve. In communication, it's much better to be behind. I mean, I mean, F. Scott Fitzgerald and Oscar Wilde and even Shakespeare and all I, I, the, these, the respected authors are never go if they're never like ahead of the curve they're always like 100 years behind the curve and then it's it's kind of heralded as as um it it, it becomes the 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 uh, point of comparison of of all um other language so normative that's okay i mean you can say um limit instead of limitation that's okay right you know here's the limit as a, as a noun, that's okay. Language, you know, limitation is really what you mean, but but that's that's all right, L limit. Um, but some, sometimes it's in songs, just like in Gummy Bears, there was uh, Beyond Compare, there's this Eagles song called Take It to the Limit. But if it was like, take it to the limitation, one more time, it wouldn't work in a song. And so over time, we start to accept these things. Limit was fine before the Eagles ever did it, but. So we, we get emails like this, and you'll, if you pay attention, you'll get them too. Provost to host conversation on fostering interdisciplinarity. Totally not a word. Totally not a word. <laughs> good song, though. Yeah, I agree. It's a good song. Eagles had a lot of good songs. It's, I mean, it's, they were never, you know, in my, in my, you know, top tier of favorite bands. But it's hard to argue that they were a successful, um, talented, uh, catchy band. 
So when I, when I get emails like this, this just tells me that the age of the university is coming to an end. Not just not just Pacific, but you're going to see this vast collapse of universities as we start moving into stuff like this and and higher and higher tuition and, and worse and worse um, just absurdity in in language and, and these sort of business speak things utilize interdisciplinarity like ah, I can't cringe hard enough. It looks like I'm having a seizure uh, when people say this stuff. So you, you, you'll encounter these things and they're just they're not words versus uh, that that's not rather than versus, you know, science writers should use the active versus the passive voice. Uh, that's like UFC, um, which you ultimate fighting championship. There's there's a, uh, a language error in that, too. In the, in the nomenclature, there's a there's an error. But versus um, it, it doesn't mean instead of right. It's 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 against. So something is against. So the active voice is not against the passive voice. But here, what's in, what's important in the message is the active voice. Just say I did this, I did that. Don't say the writer chose to. What are you talking about? I I understand that Fisher, Ronald Fisher, talked about himself in the third person, but he was writing in the 1920s, and that's how that's how science was communicated back then poorly. Science was communicated poorly back then. And you can see how absurd it gets in the passive voice when um, you can just Google the expression mistakes were made and then watch some, some uh, videos of politicians you know, whether it's, you know, George W. Bush or, or, or whatever, saying like, can you tell me what, there's tons of politicians. I just, I just happened to go with him because I, I can visualize him saying it, but <sighs> You know, tell me if you have any regrets or if you made mistakes in you know, the war in, in Afghanistan. And his response is, I'm like, well, mistakes were made. Say, I fucked up. I made mistakes. Own it. Be bold. Be brave. Be concise. Be clear. Own it. Don't say mistakes were made. Like, that's just so passive. Don't do that. Passivity is the weakest form of writing there is. I did this. Or if you have a team of, of scientists, we measured x don't say the scientists measured x like it's just so weak and passive and and retiring so so don't do it um so as an individual's limb moves further away from his or her center of mass okay first off individual this there's i mean this describes eight billion people but further is not measurable further is a sort of hypothetical space further is and farther, if you can measure it. If there's a goniometer, you can't use the word further. If there's a measuring tape, you can't use the word further. You can go further in life, um, you know, deeper and further in your thoughts, and 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 you, you make more and more progress in life. And ah, see if I can get a little bit further in in my understanding of what. That's fine for these figurative. Um, kind of cloudy distances. If it's measurable, you have to have an A in it. It has to be farther if it's measurable. And you know, sometimes, you know, or, you know, maybe even an indicator that females bring their personal issues on the field. This isn't me being sexist. This was a female student. She's actually really, she was a really good student and, and um, she's like wrapping up her MD. And so, I mean, she's a great student, but um, she, yeah, that's there's better there's more professional ways to to phrase that stuff and I offer suggestions in the in the comment box and gender and sex I just you change it to sex gender uh, sociological psychological sex is a biological so sex is biology gender is you know sociology and so it's I don't really care and 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 you'll see that when I'm doing my own research, you know, when I code databases, I just code as both ways. I, I, I don't, I don't really but if I'm trying to be clear, if I'm, if, I'm, if I'm publishing or if I'm communicating in a way where clarity is important, it's not just like me coding my databases, I, 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 then I, I'm gonna actually use it in its, its real form. I'm um, especially if you're, if you're doing research and you know, if I'm doing research in, in rib fracture care or in fall risk prevention, preventative, right? Preventive programs. Uh, or if I'm doing whatever it is, a medical database, I, I'm just, it's just all biology that I'm talking about. It, it sort of doesn't really matter. If, if I'm in sociology, then, then, it, then it's a critical distinction, um, especially if you're doing uh, work on, on non-binary identifications, things like that. It's, it's really helpful to use um, 
the words as they actually mean, what gender means and what sex means. Sex is the biology version. Um, so they, as a gender neutral singular pronoun, just don't do it. Someday, okay, it's not going to be in your lifetime, but someday you can be taken seriously when you when you do this. I promise that day is coming, but it's not anywhere near now. Uh, and when you look at all the great writing of the 20th century, we didn't have a gender neutral singular pronoun. One didn't exist. And we have you know, the canon of Western literature was not harmed by that. In no point on any single page, I mean, the bookshelf behind me is filled with mostly 19th and 20th century literature. And in nowhere in any of those, there's a single book on that on that shelf that requires the use of a gender neutral singular pronoun. And these are sort of championed as, as the pinnacle of, of human communication. I mean, this is the canon of Western literature is behind me with some you know, 21st century like nonfiction you know, entries in, in the in the shelf. But it's not it's not really a limitation that we think it is you in in Communication when you're just speaking, totally fine. In writing, you get to change your sentence. If you start a sentence and you're four words in, and like, oh no, I need a gender neutral singular pronoun here. <clears throat> Just hit the delete key a few times and start the sentence over to where you don't need it. It's really, it's not a limitation that people identify with. If if that's a limitation, if if that's a limit, right? If that's a limitation, then <sighs> I think there's some other strengthening that needs to happen. That's like saying like, oh, you know, my Achilles is a limitation to my, this is a bad analogy. You, you get the idea. It's not really a limitation if you strengthen all the words around it. Um, nothing is comprised of. Don't ever say comprised of because comprise means contain and, and nothing is contained of. Right now, the vestibular system can comprise three things or can be composed of, but don't say comprised of. That, that's not what the word actually means. And continuously proven, right? Exercise has been continuously proven to improve strength and balance for individuals who are prone to false. The whole sentence is bad. You just need to erase that entire sentence and start over. If you there's, I think Dan Brown said this. He's the guy who wrote the book Da Vinci Code, which Da Vinci wasn't Leonardo's last name. That's just where he's from. Leonardo of Vinci. You know, if you're from Stockton, your last name isn't of Stockton. Um, and so you know, there's there's a there's sort of a weird error in a Da Vinci Code. Like uh, if you're talking about Leonardo, that's 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 not really that's not his name. That's just where he's from. But and the, and the book was not particularly sophisticated in its writing, but it was it was actually a brilliant book in its construction, in its pacing, in its in its time course, and its promises, and their deliveries, and its mysteries, and their and their revealings. And and but but Dan Brown um, had this this line. I have totally forgotten my my whole life. Oh yeah, the delete key. Where where as I as you read this, I just said, delete the whole thing. Just delete the whole sentence. The whole sentence is bad. There's too many errors in that one sentence. Literally, don't salvage it. You can't salvage it. And again, literally, think literate. Nobody nobody has a ha, uh, fails to understand what literacy means. Literally means word for word. So when I say literally, I'm talking about the words in the sentence. I mean that's as literal as it gets. Um, that's as literate as literacy. Uh, oriented as it gets. Um, but, but Dan Brown's line was, if you want to see a talented writer, their delete key on their keyboard is destroyed. It's, you, you can't see the DEL or whatever was on there before. You can't see it that, because that's the thing they push more than any other button. And I, I mean, he's saying that in, in jest sort of, but with, with a lot of sincerity because you can just like highlight and hit the delete key once, but you're gonna, there, you'll have hit the A key eight times, 10 times in that sentence and you hit the delete key once delete. But you get the idea where the, you delete more than you write. If you wanna be a talented writer, there is no exception. There is no exception here. Yes, there are legends that that Oscar Wilde could could essentially write at the pace of, of talking and it would come out in final form. Christopher Hitchens was said to, to write at the pace of typing and it came out in his final form. I don't think any of those are actually true. And there's nobody alive today who's sort of cited as having that capacity of, of doing that. The delete key, you, sh you should delete more than you should write if you wanna be uh, a, a talented writer. And, and the best people in the world admit that they revise their, their things you know, 40 to 60 times before they submit them. Um, so continuous versus continual. Uh, continuous means unending. You know, like this is the song that never ends. 
and then it goes on and on, my friend, forever, right? You know the song, I hope. Or, you know, infinity bottles of, you know, beer on the bus at a wall or what a bar, whatever it is. I don't, I don't know these songs. Uh, but these, these, so they go on and on and on and on and never end. That's continuous, right? Continual is repeated. Uh, continual is you listen to a song on repeat, you're listening to it continually. Um, if you listen to a song that just doesn't end, that just the song, I mean, the earth and sun, like the sun eats up the earth and then and the song is still playing and it hasn't ended and I mean, that's continuous and so exercise is continuously proven what do you, what do you no it hasn't that that's not what that word means i mean this whole paragraph just really needed to go and and proof you know what the word proof means uh it means test but when you when you see people and you can use it to mean evidence but but it's been scientifically proven i hear so often and i wonder as opposed to what as opposed, because that's proof means scientific test, right? So scientifically proven as opposed to philosophically proven, as opposed to religiously proven, as opposed to hypothetically proven. Science, what are you doing with that word in there? That's that's ridiculous. Eliminate that word, delete key. Dan Brown, you know, destroy delete key should be, should be involved uh, there. And, you know, 13, scientifically proven signs, you're in love. Okay, you know, maybe they did some testing, Sci scientifically tested signs, and you're like, okay, but, but usually what you encounter in the world is, is mistakes of communication, and it, it, it telegraphs illiteracy in a way that if people can't get the language right, I, I distrust the science. And remember, I'm a peer reviewer for some of these journals, and people will send me things that are filled with grammar errors, and I think, you know, if you didn't take time to get the language right. How am I to be reassured that you took care and craft in the science that, that isn't just loaded with confounding variables, right? Because you're, certainly your communication is. Your communication is confounded to the max, right? You, you, you cannot ruin this communication anymore. I'm pretty sure you must have ruined the science too. Because the science, you sort of get one go at it. And then at the end of it, it's done. You can't recollect the data. With writing, you can you can oh, okay. I guess I got that one wrong. Let, let me let me phrase that again. And so if you take one go with the writing and submit it, you're always going to get rejected. I, I mean, if if you submit to a journal with an impact factor, to a journal with you know dignity, then you're going to get rejected if you have typos and grammatical errors and and. Uh, bad diction and and uh, so if you have errors here you're going to get rejected so you know my my hypothesis is that x will correlate with y everything correlates it's a matter of strength it's a matter of of you know what is that r what is the strength of that correlation that's what you're talking about that will you know, have a compelling correlation a, a positive correlation that it, you know that's that's what people want to read not just that you know x correlates with y because i mean everything has an r value of like oh my r is 0 0.0000001 and my p value is 0.9999999 okay that's a correlation that's a reportable correlation but it's a gibber it doesn't mean anything um and so if when when people use constrain um, to mean any of these words, restrain or constrict or restrict or refrain, not what it means. Constrain means compel. So let's say you're in a relationship. You're in a relationship. You are um, restrained from cheating and you are constrained to buy flowers. That's what constraint means. And so I, I encounter constrain oh, I don't know, once a month used incorrectly. And, and people have them pouring over a manuscript. Okay, it's P-O-R-E or, or P-O-R-I-N-G to pour over a manuscript. It's not juice. It's not coming out of a pitcher, right? That you're pouring on it. It means you're being absorbed in as P-O-R-E or P-O-R-I-N-G. The majority of the manuscript was handwritten. Remember, manuscript um, if you get a manicure, that's with your hands, right? So this is a handwritten thing. The majority of the manuscript is handwritten. Majority means the greater number in a countable set. It has to be countable. You know, the majority of her body was was tattooed or sunburned or something. That's that's the body isn't countable, right? Oh, you know, fifty six of your body was was sunburned. That, that doesn't make any sense. So majority has to describe uh, a countable entity. 
Um, and this one people get wrong in, in some context. So <clears throat> the E, the E, E, right? The waiter waits on the waitee. So the waitee is the one receiving all of that waiting upon. Um, the advisor advises the advisee. The advisee is, is the recipient of the advising. So uh, nominees are the ones who are receiving a nomination. Uh, refugees are the ones who are being given uh, refuge. Trustees inherit the trust fund. Amputees uh, receive the amputation. Uh, attendees, you're receiving the attendance. I mean, you're the band. If, if you're an attendee, people are, are attending you. That's what that, so you're like a concert goer, you're an attendant or something like that. Oh, the attendees. And people will say that stuff at, at, at graduation, like, oh, all of you attendees, and they're addressing the families. Nobody's attending the family, right, at, at, these, at these things. And, and same thing with like escapee. Okay, the escapee is the one who's receiving the escaping. You're escaped upon, like you're the, you know, warden of the prison or something. So Getting these things right, it's, it, there's a little bit of a cringe when when people get them wrong. Um, if you're the E, -E um, at the end, and you're receiving that service or or whatever it is. Uh, it, I just watch speeches where somebody's trying to sound powerful, and they'll use the word decimate. Right now, desolation. Uh, that's like bleak, dismal emptiness. That's what desolation is—the desolation of smog or whatever. Destruction. Everyone knows what that means. Decimation. This is an ancient Roman practice where you are punishing your own military into service because they better be just as afraid of you as they are of the enemy. Uh, if you're gonna if you're gonna win a war, your soldiers better fear you more than they fear the enemy. And so you line them up. And what's a decimal, right? What's a deciliter? What's it's ten? A decathlon, ten. So you line up your own army and kill one out of every ten of them. Right? We have ten little guys here. There's there's one bleeding out of his guts. Um, you kill one out of 10 of your own. So we decimated them. Okay, you lined up your own team and killed one out of every 10. Makes no sense. But people are trying to use bigger, powerful sounding words when it just doesn't mean anything close to what they think it means. Um, nauseous. I hear this one all the time. Oh, I'm feeling so nauseous. Okay, I better get away because that means you're going to make me throw up. Um, nauseated means you feel sick, right? The, the, the individual, you are sick. Nobody else. That is what the word individual means. Uh, nauseous means you're making other people sick. So nobody gets it wrong when they use poisonous. Ooh, I'm feeling poisonous. Okay, you're going to poison other people, right? That snake is poisonous. Okay, it's not, it's not like rolling around, clutching its tummy, saying, oh, help, help me, right? Or hissing that. Uh, this, if a snake is poisonous, it's going to poison you. Right? If it's poisoned, then you need to go to the hospital. If you're poisoned, go to the hospital. If you're poisonous, you're poisoning other people. Nauseous and nauseated, exact same thing. Don't say nauseous unless you mean you're making other people sick. You're making other people throw up. Um, random, right? That doesn't mean weird. It doesn't mean, doesn't mean unexpected or bizarre or strange or peculiar or whatever other synonym. It's not what it means. You know, I just rolled snake eyes, weird. You know, then that's random. That's random. And so uh, randomness, as you know, this is a statistics class, is, is this uh, complete lack of predictability. And, and um, although there are forms of randomness and there are predictable forms of randomness, and that's, that's sort of what we're doing in statistics, of what we're doing a regression analysis of, there, there are versions of, of random, but none of those times is it the colloquial version that people say. Convince and persuade, two totally different words. Convince means you're trying to convince somebody, you're trying to uh, make somebody believe something. You're, you're trying to uh, convince somebody of the truth in whatever, make somebody believe something. Persuade, there's a verb that you're trying to get done. Persuade has a verb there. There's an action. Persuade, you're trying to make somebody do an action to, to, to you know, you're, you're trying to persuade somebody to buy the car. You're not trying to convince somebody to buy the car. You're trying to make me believe the buy the car. It doesn't make any sense, right? Persuade, there's, you're, you're trying to make somebody do something. So don't say convince when you mean persuade. Don't say persuade when you mean when you mean convince. Uh, moments. Uh, these aren't really, moments aren't really countable. Once upon a time, moments had a more specific, a more precise 
uh, time period. And it was like a 12th of a 40th of, of a day, you know, sunrise to sunset. There's, there's this, you know, 40th of a 12th, 12th of a 40th, whatever, same thing. And that was a moment. But today, nobody knows that. And so when you say one moment, please, or you say, oh, hold on, just like five moments, give me a few moments, that's the same period of time. Right, you could say, oh, yeah, oh, can I put you on hold for a billion moments? The, the person on the other line, like, I don't know, sure, I don't know, is that like a second? Is that a minute? I haven't, can I put you on hold for a moment? Don't like count moments. It just, it just starts to sound ridiculous. There's a few moments up here, there's one moment down here. That's not like a measurable period of time. Um, litiginous, that's not a word. Uh, you know, just like um, supposedly, just like irregardless just like preventative, litigious, that's not a word. Litigious is um, litigation, right? It's a legal litigation, litigious is a word. Fantastic doesn't mean really good. You know, awesome means it, it, you are eliciting a, a, a sensation of awe, you're inspiring or, or, or um, arousing awe, you know, A-W-E. Um, awestruck, whatever, awesome. <clears throat> Fantastic doesn't have that, same meeting. It's fantasy, right? So you know what's fantastic is Gandalf. Fantastic is is like Dumbledore, and fan that's what fantastic means. It's, oh, this was fantastic. Where's the goblin? Right? Where's the the wizard's robes? Like I, that's not what fantastic means. It means fantasy, um, fabulous. That's not, you know. I don't, I don't know, Elton John or something. It's, it's fabled. I, I just, I don't know what fable Elton John is in. Uh, it's not meant to be insensitive. It's just Elton John is classically like fabulous. Um, so I'm not, I'm not making some like sociological statement there. <clears throat> and so, it, but it's not fabulous if it's not from fables. And so proverbial in our textbook, there's one of the chapters that says the proverbial sugar pill, right? The proverbial sugar pill. And I, I don't know what proverb that comes from. What, what sugar pill is in like the Hebrew Bible? Where, where's a sugar pill there? Like what, where in Proverbs do we, do we encounter this? And so these, these words, people just use them. Um, oh, the proverbial, you know, yeah, oh, I crossed the proverbial tracks. I'm on the wrong side of the tracks. Th there weren't trains in the Proverbs. I, I, don't, I don't know what you're saying. Um, viable, that doesn't mean feasible. Um, it means capable of independent existence, right? So we talk about like a viable, you know, the offspring. Um, that's, that's, is it capable of independent existence? That's what viable means. <clears throat> like uh, running the gauntlet. Oh, you had to run the gauntlet. That didn't, that's a glove, right? Nobody has ever run a glove other than bugs and ants and stuff have maybe like run through a glove. But a gantlet, that's the thing where you get these, these like old, the tie in the age where you'd, you'd put someone in like the pillory, you know, where there's that wooden thing with the three holes and you have one head and both hands in it and people throw tomatoes at you and it's sort of like public embarrassment and, and in like that age, all right, I'm gonna have you run the gantlet, right? Where we're gonna get a, two lines of people and instead of running through and giving high fives to everybody, they're gonna like whip you and hit you with stuff, 20 minutes, thanks. And so that's a gantlet. That's not a gauntlet. Less and fewer. Make sure you get this one right because this one is so commonly, people get it wrong so commonly. Uh, less is, you, you can't count it. There's less grass. There's less dirt. There's less light. Uh, there's less oxygen in the air. There's le if you can count it, it's fewer, right? There's fewer blades of grass. There are fewer leaves on the plant. There are fewer crayons in the Crayola box. There are fewer participants in the study. If you can count it, you have to say fewer. If you can't count it, say less. Now data, this is a statistics class, right? Data versus datum, um, that would mean against. Data rather than datum. And there's, there's this argument, you know, I had this old professor uh, when I was doing my PhD who just, was so like adamant about about th this subject of um, she would just scold everybody if they used uh, data as a singular. 
uh, noun. And as opposed, you know, uh, as opposed to plural, our data is plural. Okay, datum is singular. So datums, I once I knew somebody who loved the word datum so much. I heard him say datums. Really good, really good student. Datums. Uh, but I, I have my qualms with this because uh, the same professor would say, and this is an exact quotation, I, I know Adam and Tim, um, Amanda and Tim both. Um, and you know, why do Amanda's subjects have less data than Tim's? Now, the, the previous slide, if you can count it, it's fewer. That's the rule, right? So if data is plural, it's why do Amanda's subjects have fewer data than Tim's? That's the rule. It starts to sound a little bit silly when you do this stuff. So if you just start thinking about some other things like grass, right, rice, oatmeal, um, mass nouns and count nouns. A mass noun is like oatmeal, toothpaste, rice, grass, uh, cereal, uh, whatever, you know, dirt. Oh, these are mass nouns. Um, so you're not going to ask, you know, how many grass are in the yard? How many rice are in the bowl? Like, you know, how many oatmeal did you have for breakfast? And how much? With a mass noun, you say, how much of a thing did you have or do you see or is there? Um, so how much oatmeal? How much rice are you going to have? And the same way is how much data do you do you have on this on this subject? How much data do you have just to to support that that claim, right? So it's it becomes you don't say how many data do you have? How many data do you have to support that? It just it starts to sound like a translation that didn't quite come through. What I said in Steven Pinker, uh, his claim, like if you've ever read a, a bad Google translation, that's what it starts to sound like. How many data do you have to support that claim? Uh, data you can think of as the grass, rice, and oatmeal as a mass noun, right? Not a count noun. Otherwise, you would have to say, if it's this plural, you would have to say, how many data do you have? And so, you know, how much money do you have? Well, comparable amounts of grass, money, um, uh, and data, right? Grass, oatmeal, money, data. And so if you can have some data and some rice, we're looking at data more as a mass noun than a count noun. And traditionally people will say data, plural, say data are, never say data is. The standards are beginning to be relaxed on these things. The, the, the standards are, are most sources are beginning to permit data as a singular, um, sort of a singular, like as, as in it's a, a mass noun, it's not a count noun. So you don't really have to use it in its, in its data R uh, state. That, having said that, I would still advise that you do, just like I would advise that you use a P of 0.05. And I would advise that you have a 95% confidence interval. And I would you have standards of communication, say data are, but don't I, I realize the, the reality of what data, the nature of that word. Um, the, it's, you're, you're, you are humoring people who don't haven't really dissected the grammar with it when you say data are targets you know you can't uh, oh you know we um, we exceeded our targets okay I imagine you are an archer and you're like oh i exceeded my target i shot like way past the the target so i you know, bullseye that's not what targets mean you can't exceed a target if you do you fail um and so that's sort of a business thing via um is direction via does not that's not the means via is direction so if you're going home for the holidays you can go via uh i5 or 99 or or, or whatever uh, this is mel gibson you know i got to where i am uh via hard work rocky relationships and if you ever listen to some of his rants man that guy's not friendly uh to particular populations and particular individuals um so complement, complement with, with an E versus um, the I. Let's put these against each other. Um, I'm not immune to, to grammar mistakes. So complement with, with an I, complement, meant is this is you're giving somebody praise. Complement means these things go well together. These two things 
uh, kind of belong in tandem. You know, Mark McGuire and Jose Canseco is like the 1980s example of two athletes who go together. 1990s example, I don't know, Michael Jordan, Scottie Pippen, maybe, and I don't know anything after that. Um, Anti-social. Uh, that has nothing to do with quiet and withdrawn. That's, that's unsociable. Unsociable is that. But everyone's like, I, I am antisocial. Okay, that's like Ted Kaczynski, the Unabomber, was antisocial. He is against society and he's blowing things up. The antisocial is like the person who does the school shooting. That's antisocial. That's not, that's not what you mean. If, if, if you call yourself antisocial, um, I'm going to like worry that you made the bomb threat. That's what antisocial means. Unsociable is, is the word most people, most people mean. Um, antisocial is, is probably aggressive. It doesn't mean like withdrawn. Here's where we get into the ultimate fighting championship. Ultimate does not mean good or best or great. It has nothing to do with that. It, it means last. Ultimate means last. Penultimate, that's not like super great. That means second to last. And so if I was the ultimate runner in that race, I'm the last one, right? Everyone go home now. I finally crossed the finish line. You pack up and go home. Right, that's what ultimate means. And so this is the ultimate warrior in wrestling. I used to watch him when I was a little kid and wrestling still exists. So he wasn't the ultimate warrior, right? So ultimate fighting championship, there's gonna be another fight tomorrow. What are you talking about? It's the last fight. This, the ultimate fighting championship. This is not the championship that ends all championships. It's not the very final one. That's what ultimate means. How did ultimate? become what it is? I don't know. That's a good question. I have no idea how it came, became what it is. I think people just thought it meant something really cool, like decimate. How did decimate come to you? Oh, we decimated them. Your own, you killed your own people, right? That was the ultimate decimation. Uh, that was the last time ever that you killed your own people, right? That was the, that was the final time that, that in ancient Rome, they, they lined up their own people and killed exactly 10% of them, the ultimate decimation. So how these words come to mean, I think people just don't know the definitions and they should hire me. I think there's two, there's two points at which I wish people would, would consult me first. One of them is in the naming of horses. Okay, just watch the Kentucky Derby or dressage, whatever, watch anything. The names of these horses, I mean, Seabiscuit is an exception. That one's fine. I would have let that one go. Seabiscuit, yeah, all right, fine, fine move, move along. But most of these are bad puns that have four or five words in them, and there's sentences. I, I, what are these people doing? The, the, the horses, like, there's no kind of self-respecting horse would be okay with that name. And the other part is, well, <laughs> I'll put it as also in the naming of like furniture stores. I used to live in Chicago and furniture with an A in it was, was, on, was on all of these things. Uh, but any, any like nomenclature, any naming of things where, where it's going to stick. Uh, I, wish, I wish people would, would, hey, Courtney, what do you think of this before it, before it comes up? So like a furniture with an A in it. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe we should change that so you actually spell it right. Um, so this, when I bought, you know, quarantine happened, so I went and bought a TRX, and I almost didn't buy it because of this line. Mesh travel pouch for ultimate portability. I, the last time you ever travel, you're going to die after you use this, right? This is the last, the ultimate portability. You, you, you mobilize this thing a single time. Now, terminology, we all know what ologies are, right? Criminology, we know what that is, the study of crime, right? Astrology is not really the study of astronomy, sort of but uh, you know, oncology and biology, sociology, archeology, span radiology, dermatology, all of these things, it's a study of, so is terminology, it's a study of terms. It doesn't mean the terms themselves. You know, it's not lexicon, it's not vocabulary, parlance, it's, it's, it's not that. That's not what terminology means. So unless you're talking about a field of study, a field of study, don't use the word terminology. Um, and this, you can totally end a sentence in a preposition, that's fine. Um, this is when people's like, I am a grammar Nazi. And then they say, don't end a sentence in a preposition or begin a sentence in a conjunction, you know, and blah, 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 blah at. You know, a, a, a preposition. The plane flew X the cloud. Solve for X. There's your preposition. It flew toward, on, above, at, whatever. Those are all your, your, your prepositions. 
um, you know, I stood blank the car. Okay, whatever, your, your prepositions. You can totally end sentences and prepositions in English. English is a Germanic language, right? There are post positions uh, in, in Latin. English doesn't come from Latin. And yeah, we, we've inherited some words. We've, we have imported some words from Latin, but the grammar rules aren't, aren't from Latin. And, and so you know, Latin has these post positions and pre positions and prepositions and don't end a sentence in a preposition. That, that's not a rule. That's not real. And then when, when people say, you can't, end, you can't begin a sentence in a conjunction, that's just because little kids tell stories so badly that they never end. Right, and then I, so I was at recess, and Sally was chasing me, and I was running, and and I tripped, and I got a bloody knee, and I went inside, and she put a bandaid on it, and and I put my gum in her hair as she was doing that, and she got really mad, and she sent me to time out. The ands just stop your sentence every once in a while. Don't start a sentence in a conjunction. So that's what we tell little kids. Five minutes, thanks. But you're not little kids, right? I'm not a little kid. You're not little kids. You can totally start. There's no, there's no where in English does it say you can't end a sentence in a preposition or or begin one in a conjun conjunction. That's that's not. Those aren't English rules. Now there, this is at which the body started at. Okay, this is bad. Uh, that Paul McCartney song, uh, "Live and Let Die." this ever-changing world in which we live in. I think, okay, you're just trying to get, you just need that syllable. Uh, and so you had to be better off to just mumble or, or cough or something because the, the grammar was, was so bad there. But you avoid the preposition if it's convenient. I mean, there's, I, I don't know the contemporary musical examples, but you know, Beck and Gavin Rossdale Bush, um, there's a lot of where it's at, where you're at. And like, okay, where you are, that's what you mean. Not where you are at, oh, yeah, it's not necessary. So you can put it in there if it's necessary. You know, look out, get down. You're, you're, you're ending sentences all over these. This public bench has hardly been slept on. Okay, like on this bench, comma, has hardly been slept. It's just that we're being shot at. At us, shot is happening. It's just, you can't rephrase these things. You know, what you up to? To what are you up? It just starts to sound really bad. And Winston Churchill had this this criticism that I don't think really actually belonged to him, but it has been cited, uh, to, it has been sort of ascribed to him so many times, we'll just pretend he said it, where he, somebody rearranged their sentence so grotesquely that he said, this is nonsense up with which I will not put. No, I won't put up with it. Um, I, this, this I you know, cannot put up with. Um, and so th there's there's like, there's this America song. You, you don't know the band America. I mean, they're really, they're not that good. It's this acoustic band from whatever the seventies. And there's a song called the horse with no name. And it says, you know, there ain't no one for to give you no pain. I, you don't even need the preposition there. I mean, this is, it just gets a little bit ridiculous with, with some of these things. So don't, don't, don't um, like, don't worry about prepositions. If you can avoid it a little bit, fine. Let's, let's do that avoidance. Otherwise um, just don't, worry about it. Now you do research in a field, you don't do research on. So if it's like I'm doing research on COVID, you're really doing research in COVID. Otherwise, if if you're a search uh, squad, right, you're, you're, you're out looking for the missing girl or something, you're, you're not looking for her on the woods, right? You're looking for in the woods and you're looking for answers in a field of study. You're not looking for them on the field of study. If something is different, it's not different than, it's different from. You have this point of comparison. Uh, you, so, so, you know, Toyotas are different from Honda, Hondas. And commiserate to, I don't see this very often, maybe once a year, commensurate with is usually what, pe what people mean as opposed to commiserate to. And let's end, this will be the last slide and I'll pick up later, but, um, just re reread your sentences sometimes. So, you know, uh, the development of CD CBD is correlated with the incidence of specific risk factors, some of which can be controlled with a healthy diet and participating in routine exercise. If you get rid of with a healthy diet, some of which can be controlled with participating in exercise, should be participation. So if you start removing some commas sometimes, you will notice that the sentence doesn't make any sense, right? And so, uh, if you have little parenthetical moments, you know, 
read the sentence without them and see if it still makes sense to to where if clause you know number one and and or the beginning of the sentence ends with the the end of the sentence and and just make sure they're they are compatible okay so that's grammar part one there's a lot and none of it you're going to be held accountable for on any test question but uh, how to not make mistakes because remember i my job is to give you more earning potential. My job is based on preparing you for the real world, which is just mean and super unfair. You know, if you think bio and chem are unfair, I don't know what to tell you. Life is meaner than that. Life is meaner than bio. Life is meaner than any chem professor on campus, and you have to be ready for it. And so the, the, the stuff that I can do to try to get you ready is try to get you published and try to get your communication ready. And this communication part is it's important, but I'm not holding you accountable for it. That's everything for today. Questions? I will take that as a no. And I will see everybody on Monday. Go do weekend things whatever that means, whatever the weekend stuff is, go do that and I will see you in a couple of days. Hey everyone. Pull up the slides. Okay. So hopefully we'll make it through today. The last grammatical one. Um, comment box is up. So it's, it's officially wear your pajamas to work day, which I think is has been official since March. I don't think anyone's worn anything but pajamas for uh, since quarantine started, but today you have your national holiday excuse. So we're going to finish up <clears throat> the grammar, effective writing, effective clarity and communication. And this m yesterday, I uploaded uh, the study slides, the review slides for the upcoming exam. The main thing to do to study is download these and go through them and do them. And because that's really what the test is, is a bunch of uh, scenarios, a bunch of research scenarios. And you have to read their outputs and interpret those outputs. It's just a bunch of this stuff, these exact analyses. You have to read and interpret their outputs. And then I would present a research question. And then you have to decide what statistical model out of these, what you don't have to read outputs for a negative binomial or Poisson regression, but um, knowing its situation, its context, when you would use that one. And so I think it's starting at, at lecture 22 is when every single lecture there was something close to every single lecture, there were a bunch of scenarios and reading outputs and, and those practices. So I would start going through those and making sure you can do them, making sure they make sense. And what I say is the appropriate one. That was the same idea that you had for the appropriate statistic. Or when I say, here's what unstandardized beta is, here's what the R squared means, or a Pearson correlation coefficient, or the odds ratio, that EXPB exponential of beta, whatever the analysis is that you can find what it means and interpret it in the same way that I do in the lectures. That's the bulk of the, I mean, that's like 80 plus percent of the test is just doing that. So if you do those practice uh, exams, those two practice exams before the test, they're not due until after, but it's the best way to study is to go through those and to use the lectures. I think it begins at lecture 22 going forward to use those as uh, study sessions for how to assign an appropriate statistical model and then how to interpret the outputs, right? SPSS outputs. So um, this is the review slides. They're up. If you pull that up, you'll see everything needed for 
exam preparation, all of the appropriate slides. This stuff isn't going to be on the test. This is just for poster and, and hopefully to uh, get you ready for you know, uh, better communication in graduate school and graduate applications, when you're writing entrance essays or personal statements, all of every one of these endeavors requires clarity of communication. And earlier, I mean, going back to, to a very early slide, this is David Sedaris, New York Times bestseller. Everything he writes is just New York Times for eternity. I mean, it's just he's one of the, the most esteemed writers of late 20th and early 21st centuries. And, and I mean, he talks about revising everything 20, 30 times for his draft. I mean, the guy's nearly 60 years old. He's, he's somewhere near you know, up late 50s or something. He's been doing this forever. And his advice to people is to revise 60 times. And he himself is going to still go through uh, at least 20 revisions. When you see everything he publishes, there's you know draft 20, draft 30, something like that. And if you look historically at, uh, this isn't a new concept of, of revision, uh, Blaise Pascal, he had this line, you know, I would have written a shorter letter, but I didn't have the time. And something similar has been written by Franklin and John Locke and, and this idea that it takes time to compose concise communication. It takes time to express yourself with brevity. That's that's a big undertaking. Just to to meet 2000 characters, let's say. That's the ACSM character limit for for abstracts. There's a maximum of 2000 characters. You can't hit character number 2001. It's like a it's like a tweet, right? It tells you how many characters over whatever that is, 144 or 200 and something, whatever it is for for Twitter abstracts for science have a maximum length. If you write up to that length, it's going to be horrible. What you want to do is write down to the length. You want to write well beyond that length. Just like with a tweet, if you use Twitter, I imagine you've been up against that boundary, that, that maximum uh, character count and you had to revise down and it's a stronger message if you go through like 50 revisions god knows trump has it says in the in the comment box so uh but to, but to, to revise down to get it to be as lean as possible that's the goal and this is one of my old ACSM abstracts that, that I wrote I did a word count on it and so you can see how many characters uh, it had now, I can never remember which version. I think it actually is this version. I think it's with spaces, but I'm not positive. The ACSM 2000 character limit. So I write twice as many characters. You know, I write 650 words for something that's going to get down to 300 words. I have to lean it out. And so this is Ronnie Coleman. Uh, I don't know who the, you know, today's bodybuilders are. But Ronnie Coleman today uses like five canes and crutches and, and machines to walk. And... Um, uh, but to get stage ready, you have to get really lean, right? And a lot of what you're eliminating, I mean, his muscle volume is higher here than it is here. You have to lose a little bit of muscle to get it stage ready. If you watch, the, if you go get like a DVD of a movie, if, if this is sort of the last era in which you can, you can acquire a DVD, and there'll be the deleted scenes on the disc, go to the bonus features and look at the deleted scenes. And a lot of those deleted scenes, those are the best scenes in the movie. They're hilarious. It's the, the comedy works, the lines are perfect, the writing is some of the best in the entire movie, or if it's like The Office or something and, and, and you're watching the deleted scenes that didn't make the episode, those are often the best scenes, but they didn't work. There was a matter of pacing. There was some sort of cadence. There was there was delivery on the promise made at the start of the episode or the start of the movie that gets a little bit sluggish, and so people will lose interest. There are reasons good content gets deleted. The cliche is kill your darlings. You have to kill your darlings. You have to be able to delete things because they don't enhance the, the overall product. You can't have too much you know, affection for anything you've written. You have to be 
able to purge those things, even if you're proud of your writing, in the interest of the composition, of the whole composition. So Ronnie Coleman, to get stage ready, he's not going to win a contest. This is obviously bodybuilding. It's not just some like weird, huge giant. And so he's up on stage. This is off season, right? You're not going to win the con. He's going to come in last place if he comes in looking like this. Now he's he has less total muscle mass. If you were to do uh you know hydrostatic assessment figure out his body composition or an mri or something figure out his body composition or a dexa who cares do some sort of body composition he has more muscle here than he has here kill your darlings you have to lose a little bit to get stage ready and you have to do the exact same thing with the acsm or any other form of writing you overwrite and then you cut and then you cut and then you cut a hundred percent of the time good writing is a matter of editing good writing is a matter of deleting <laughs> well, well we'll get to the the, the questions maybe at the end i, I, I want to see yeah, other than i'm uh, talking about ronnie coleman and physiology and nutrition, I, I want to keep it on, on the writing, but we will talk about that later. So it's a matter of cutting. You have to get all lean and, and veiny. And, and last lecture, I mentioned that Dan Brown quotation. Now, it's, it's not as though I think Dan Brown is this wonderful writer, but he's a masterful storyteller. The writing isn't isn't all that good, but the storytelling is is very masterful. And there's a lot of writers like that. They're usually the super popular ones, the Stieg Larson girl with a or whatever. and uh, masterful storytelling and the writing isn't all that good, but but Dan Brown has this line about the delete key is going to be mangled on your keyboard. You want to see who a good writer is? Look at the delete key. The, the word delete will have been faded from repeat uses. It's, it's going to be like chipped and broken and 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 you know taped back together. And, and that's good writing. Now it's said somewhat in jest because you just highlight and hit delete one, whatever. You, you get the idea. You don't actually hit the delete key that much, but but good writing is deleting. Now, last lecture, I mentioned data and data, where data you can think of as a mass noun, not a count noun. So rice, right? Rice is a mass noun. Grains of rice, that's count. That's a count noun. You can count grains of rice. You can't count rice or grass. And uh, data you can think of as similar, similar to information, where there are a lot of information. Sounds awkward, right? Sounds awkward because it's a it's a mass noun, and there are a lot of data to support. Yeah, and so when people work too hard to make data a plural, it gets a little bit obnoxious. And New York Times, these are one day apart, January 9th in the New York Times, January 10th in the New York Times, look at the use of data. While the survey data are still being analyzed, right? Data are, meaning data are plural. It's not data is being analyzed. But down here, this is one day later, we have data being used as a, uh, as a singular. See, I can't even find it in here, wherever, wherever the word data appears. There it is. The first year for which data is available, not data are available. So nobody really cares. Don't, when people say data, that's plural. Or, you know, they, uh, there's a history of mass nouns and count nouns and, and, and sort of the minutia of, of uh, linguistic laws is important here. You can use it in either way, but people are probably going to uh, respond negatively if you're using data in a singular sense. So use it plural or just revise the sentence so that it's, you can't even tell uh, whether it's plural or singular. That's usually what I do because I just don't like the idea of data R because like, yeah, it's not really honoring the the nature of the word. And so I'll, I'll usually just revise and revise until nobody can tell whether I'm using data as singular and plural um, or I'll use it in a in a plural sense that's just so unimposing that nobody would notice this uh, ending a sentence in a preposition totally do it it's fine avoid it where possible avoid ending a sentence in a preposition where possible but you don't have to avoid it it's it, that's a law in latin there are prepositions um, and postpositions and we, this is a germanic language you know, english so we, we don't have all the same laws getting into some new information uh, the 
a, a semicolon, a semicolon, usually get rid of it, usually get rid of it and just put a period in and have two totally different clauses. Now, if you want two independent clauses holding hands, being sociable, uh, fine, use, use a semicolon. I'll use semicolons often in certain contexts of writings. It's being companionable, one sentence with the next. My sentence is sociable. I'm going to hook it up. I'm going to have it hold hands with this other sentence, which is really about the same thing, but they're, they're you know, autonomous clauses. They, they work on their own. And there are contexts in which I'll use the semicolon. Usually when I'm revising writing, I just say get rid of it. It's, it's annoying. It doesn't really, it, you just put a period in and you're just confusing people. Now, if you have a serial list of things, if it's, if it's like uh, Stockton, California, like Stockton, Cal um, comma, Cal CA, semicolon. If you just have a series of colons and then like Lodi, comma, CA, semicolon. You don't want to have just comma, 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 because it just gets weird and hard to read and you have no idea where anything belongs. But in that case, I'll usually just put periods. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, hey, or I'll phrase the sentence in a different way because, because these, these lists, what you see over here of Stores, Connecticut, Manchester, Connecticut, Hartford, Connecticut, gets a little bit difficult to read. But a colon or a semicolon, lists of things, you just have a colon before you're going to have the, the list start. And uh, if you have a, the, for the semicolon, if you have two independent clauses that are sort of conjoined, um, that's fine to use a semicolon there, but, but I would just avoid it and put in periods where possible. Now, in your scientific writing, you're going to see a lot of et alls. And AL, you need a period after that thing. It's, it's, it's an abbreviation for Aaliyah. It means and others. So we're getting into, into Latin. Um, and our Latin, uh, if, I don't know, infestations of, of English language. And a lot of these abbreviations we'll, we'll see are, are Latin. So at all, and like incredible, that doesn't belong in scientific writing. So if you think of inconceivable, like Princess Bride, right? Inconceivable means you can't conceive it. Inconsiderate means you're not being considerate. Incredible, okay, I, that's not a credible claim, you know. And so, incredible has it, at its at its root words a slightly different meaning than wow, oh my gosh, I am in awe, right? It's it's not quite the same thing. And, and in scientific writing, it just is it rings phony. It rings sort of false. Oh, this is an incredible amount of people that. And you should also never say people that. It's people who. Objects that. It is Pokemon is fine to say Pokemon that do my battle for me, right? It's fine to say uh, the windows that need cleaning. It's fine to say uh, the spoons that are, are big enough for serving. But people, it's not people that, unless you're objectifying people so outrageously that, uh, you know, it's like, oh, you know, this group of people that, I mean, I, that's like, re reserve that for, I don't know, people at war who are trying to um, remove the humanity of their opponents so when they shoot them, they can sleep at night. Oh, those people that, fine. In that situation, if you're like forced to kill people and you want to objectify them and, and to they're like these just objects, okay, yeah, good, go go for that. But in if you're being humane, it's people who, and then this all this al this this you know this author at all you, you have to put a period because it's an abbreviation, right? Aaliyah, it's an abbreviation, and so you always put a period after that one, but you never put a period after et. It just means and. This is and others. So Jen Ness, this is you know Van Ness and me if we were conjoined, uh, and others, and then that's a plural, right? So so Jen Ness at all state the kidney is a hub for whatevering. It's not states that we that you know these people states right that's a grammatical error so if it is you know jensen at all um suggest that you should do the practice tests or something it's not jensen it would be jensen suggests 
Jensen at all suggest because it means and others always put a period here never put a period after that one i.e we're still in Latin um, so this with many studies focusing on the use of questionnaires i.e profile of mood states a self-reporting method blah, blah 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 this means every questionnaire is a profile of mood states i.e that that's that, that's what that means is that's to say or in other words that's what ie means and so in that last one every single questionnaire that exists that has been made by people who uh you know come up with research whatever is a profile of mood states that's what ie means if you're going to say well for example then you use eg eg is for example and so that last one over here this should have been eg profile of mood states. Um, questionnaires, for example, a profile of mood states. That should be EG because IE makes no sense. It means every single questionnaire that's ever been devised is a profile of mood states. And that's that's not true. And when you look at stuff, you know, two to three days per week, still worth of Latin here, and five days a week, that's in the same sentence. And just five days a week is totally fine. Two to three days per week, fine. But be consistent in, in what you use. Don't bounce back and forth in one sentence. It's two to three days per week, progressing to five days a week. It just it looks weird. And make sure uh, you get your actual words correct, that the, that the words mean what you think they mean. Now, per se, again, more Latin, per se does not mean you know, well, exactly, you know, it's not a sports car per se, but it really does accelerate when, when you, it has a bunch of pep when you get that gas pedal pressed down. That's not what per se means. Per se is on its own. So uh, nobody gets us wrong with things like acapella, you know, you're singing by yourself, acapella, um, or a la carte, the food comes by itself. That's what per se means. It's, it's by itself. So, you know, the recumbent bike, you know, that one that you're like, you sit probably like in the posture you're sitting in now and your feet are sort of out in front of you. I'm basically in a recumbent bike at the moment. It's, it's the equivalent. My posture is in the equivalent of a, of a recumbent bike. And so if I were to say, you know, the recumbent bike, the stationary recumbent bike, it's not a bicycle per se. What that literally means is uh, it's in a row. It's not a recumbent, it's not a bicycle per se, means it's in a row of bicycles. And so don't use per se to mean, well, you know, not exactly, because that's not what it means. It means by itself, and, and almost everyone gets that wrong. Now, moving into a, to a section we'll call pointless words and other unnecessary typing, things to purge. Whenever I do, as a professor, we have to do these advisor training and harassment trainings, and there's a thousand trainings we have to do. And I put them off until the last possible, like how quickly do I think I could finish this training? I bet I could do it in, in you know, 18 minutes or something. So 20 minutes before the time that I'm no longer a professor is when I start doing these trainings. I mean, I hate all of these things because they come with stuff like this. And it's just, the communication is so bad. And imagine if you gave this to, I don't know, like any, any seriously talented writer. I mean, any from, from David Sedaris to Christopher Hitchens back to Shakespeare. Uh, give these to a talented writer and the, the cringe is gonna be so hard, they will, they will probably be hospitalized for it. Oh, it's the seizure we have to, to, to address. And so the researcher of this study We'll look at the effect of just say I. We will look. I will look. Th that's the active writing. Is own it. Be direct. Be concise. Be specific, and own it. Own up to to what's doing. The researcher hypothesizes that there will be, nah, stop. That's in the 1920s. People thought that was good writing. It isn't anymore. Even like the jazz age, right? F. Scott Fitzgerald was writing in the jazz age, and and he would he would cringe at that. Now he was writing when people did that, and so it was never really good writing to do this. But but people more recently realized that active writing actually communicates with people because when you're talking, when when you are communicating with people, and you say the speaker of this sentence wants you to, uh, you you sound insane right you have some sort of mental issue and people will start taking steps back like if you're in a room and somebody starts coughing a bunch you know how you sort of lean backwards and, and start to to take a few steps back because you don't want to get sick people will do that from you 
thinking you're mentally sick if you say the speaker of this sentence requests that you it sounds crazy why do people do it in writing if if we know in speech it sounds so absurd and so stuff like this that you can just hit the delete key right dan brown hit the delete key the research study in which the variables relating to just delete that whole thing delete all of that and just begin the sentence lower extremity strength and balance will be assessed before and after the training program that's a complete sentence the research study in which the variables relating to lower extremity strength and balance will be assessed. The sentence is ruined by this appearance. It actually ruins the sentence and it wastes the reader's time. It accomplishes two terrible things. That's that you'd never do that in writing. Every single word should stand on its own. Every single word should have a purpose. Otherwise, kill your darlings, right? If that word doesn't have a purpose, if that sentence doesn't have a purpose, if that paragraph doesn't have a purpose, if it doesn't communicate, if it can be shortened, if it's unnecessary, get rid of it. Like this one. Of these falls, common injuries include, but are not limited to, if you say include, this is inferred. Uh, this word doesn't mean all encompassing include doesn't mean everything it means it includes x y and z and and we could keep going or i'm not going to keep going but we could that's what include means but are not limited to that can be inferred so if something can be inferred don't type it and right now i mean stuff like this just communication right now now you know per se means the same thing now on its own means the same thing. If you were a cappella ing the word now, nobody would assume it means anything but now. Right now, I, I, I don't, I don't get what what this words of emphasis. Once in a while, a word of emphasis is helpful, but usually you just want to com communicate emphasis with good writing. Never use crazy punctuation. And uh, there's the book Freakonomics. Stephen Dubner and Stephen Levitt had this. One of the chapters was about real estate, and in these real estate flyers, go walk around your neighborhood, walk around a neighborhood and look at the real estate flyers. Real estate agents aren't very good at communication. You think they would be because communication is a huge part of their job. They're going to take 6% of the closing sale, probably something like that. It depends. They're going to take a lot of the closing sale. You'd think they would have learned how to communicate by now, but some studies were looking at, at if you put in a bunch of exclamation points, three fireplaces, and then just as many exclamation points as fireplaces, you're reducing the the likelihood of the sale you're devaluing the house because why you're trying to push something over on me here right this is very counterfeit why are you shouting the truth doesn't need to be bellowed through a veiny neck right the truth can can be finessed into a sentence you don't need to shout the truth what you need to do you can delicately uh, assert things and and we will have more trust to them that's why when you watch presidential debates or any other debate and somebody starts yelling at the other person like okay that person has just lost the debate the truth doesn't need to be to be shouted like that um but sometimes there are these words of emphasis that are a bit much the epidemic shouldn't appear two times in a single paragraph it's a big word it's a powerful word think of you don't go drop you know an atom bomb every five minutes like this is okay uh, there's there's a time and a place there's probably never a time and a place but 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 this uh, there are big words that just draw too much attention to themselves and you can't drop two bombs in, in one sentence and this is me revising somebody else's i don't need to keep putting in these things uh but somebody had had two adverbs and so in, in a in a in one sentence there's routinely and delightfully and uh, you know, consider adverbs, any of these Lee words. Uh, so when somebody says like drive safe, you mean safely, right? So yeah, it should be an adverb there. Uh, consider it like hot paprika, right? There's a little bit of uh, adverbing is okay, a little bit. You, you can you can add some some flavor, but too much, and it's just it just burns your mouth. Nah, don't don't use adverbs that much or adjectives for that matter. Try, try to try to avoid adjectives as much as you can. Grueling practices, like let me, let your reader decide what the adjective is. So think about um, wine tasting and somebody asks you, what does this wine taste like? You're the sommelier or something. Somebody asks you, what does this wine taste like? And you say the word fruity. I, I have no idea what fruity tastes like. Is it strawberries? Is, is it that noun? Is it peaches? Is it that noun? Is it grapes? Is it that noun? Is it what noun? Is it nouns and verbs? Those are the only meaningful words. Adjectives don't describe anything. Fluffy. Okay, what do you mean fluffy? Is it fluffy like a dog's fur? Is it fluffy 
like an afro? Is it fluffy like a cloud? Is it fluffy like a cotton ball? Is it fluff? What do you mean fluffy? Did it, is it a blanket that just came out of the dryer? Nouns communicate things. Adjectives are lazy writing that is so imprecise and it never describes anything. I mean, there's really no good adjective to use. The first thing you should do when you're going through your writing is just get rid of adjectives. I will decide, let the reader decide what an, an appropriate adjective is. Just describe the verbs and nouns and I'll, Ooh, that's grueling, I'll say in my head or I'll use my lips to make those sounds, my lips and tongue and whatever to, to make those sounds. And but don't put adjectives in somebody else's mouth because because your grueling and their grueling might not mean the same thing at all. Grueling to an 82 year old is not grueling to an Olympic soccer player or whatever. Just don't use adjectives. They're, they're just meaningless words. And then again, it's when we can purge something, you know, in the beginning of the season, hockey players and hockey players. OK, well, we already know it's, it's hockey players, um, athletes that you already know it's athletes who don't say athletes that unless the athletes are robots right if it's if it's what's that like uh, i think it's disney channel movie if it's not disney where like the boy makes the fighter robot <laughs> whatever I'm, I'm clearly not uh, up to date with with movies uh, but um whatever like a robot wars and stuff okay that's an athlete that if, if you're talking about the robot specifically but if it's a person it's athletes who amongst don't say amongst amongst unless you even if you're writing you know a prequel to lord of the rings you're writing a prequel to lord of the rings even then just say among because amongst is too written from on high old english trying to sound like it's a fantasy novel set in some medieval that don't don't do that whence you'll often see in that context too but whence doesn't mean where it means from where. So if somebody says from whence, here's Elrond, let's go back to Lord of the Rings, it must be taken deep into Mordor and cast back into the fiery chasm from whence it came. That means from, from where it came. Cast back into the fiery chasm from, from where it came, because whence means from where. Cast into the fiery chasm whence it came. Don't use whence, but most people use it wrong. If you do decide to use it, there are moments which whence can add emphasis, usually in a comical way, usually in some sort of, you're, you're incorporating a little uh, you know, humor into the line with a whence. There's moments where it can be, it can be sort of peppered in as punctuation. And, but don't say from whence. And uh, on the subject of pleonasms, which is, is these unnecessary words, why does that word appear? You, you, there's no reason to have that word. Small of a sample size, sport of soccer. What else can soccer be but a sport? What, what you know, it, the, the religion of soccer, I, I don't know, maybe, I, it is, you know, the the uh, you know the the dishes the the food of soccer I, I don't know, this sport soccer is a sport and small of sample size size really can only be small so a smaller effect size don't say that just say a smaller effect small implies size right a year's time what else is a year but time one must plan ahead you can't plan behind Right, you, you, there, you, unless you have a time machine, and uh, but you know the general consensus. A consensus is generality. A short summary. What else is a summary but brevity? I was first introduced to this person. Introduced is your first encounter. What do you mean first? In, there is no second introduction. Right, introduction means means the the original uh, appearance. Um, an old adage, intended purpose, cheapest price. Uh, it just it's the cheapest one. I, what do you mean? Price? There's what else can be cheap but price? The fastest speed. You get the idea. Each and every. It's just pick one. Uh, you're getting greedy here. Each and every. It is too much greed. Um, and so we need to start eliminating these pleonasms. These these repetitive words that add nothing to the sentence. You're just wasting the reader's time. Students will be back again in September. Recall back. I saw it with my own two eyes. What else could you see it with? Your imagination, maybe. I saw it with my own imagination. Oh, okay, I don't know. But people usually understand that that you know you see stuff with your eyes. It's like I heard about it via word of mouth uh, as opposed to word of touch. Right, word of telepath, get okay, word of belly button. It, it could, word, 
<laughs> like word of mouth. What else? You know. So, and so again, with the plenisms, conclusion. To conclude, ah, get rid of that. Um, and so getting tautological, which means you just say, I mean, literally the same thing. Um, an ATM machine, right? Automatic teller machine, machine. A PIN number, personal identification number, number. Or a VIN, if it's a vehicle identification number, number. I mean, that's what you're saying. Oh, where's the ATM machine? Where's the automatic teller machine machine? And so these are these are tautologies. And, and so purging a lot of these things. Now, expressions in general usually should be purged because it's just leaning on somebody else's novelty, leaning on somebody else's expression, someone else's words, uh, you know, it's really piqued the interest of my glycolytic system. And like, ah, the glycolytic system isn't conscious, right? But, but peaked, it's not like a mountain peak. It's not an elevation over here. The question, are these all past projects? Yes, they're all, not really for this class. I, I, it is very little I've, I've taken from, from this one. There's a couple of posters I've taken things from and I always de-identify, nobody's name will ever appear. Some of these uh, people went on to be physical therapists. Some of them, you can see a lot of this is from 2016, right? So, so a lot of these things are pretty old. Um, and they didn't have the luxury of me having corrected this publicly before. And so they were going into their writing projects, having never heard my literary rants about never do this thing. It sounds horrible. Uh, the idea, the goal in life is to communicate with clarity and, and, and to be you know, articulate and, and direct. <clears throat> they had never heard this speech in 2016. And so they were the raw material so that I could give it to ward off future occurrences of uh, 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 you know, a mountain peak of interest. It has a Q in it, right? You're, you're arousing interest, you're, you're P-I-Q-U-E-I-ing. Um, and in the long run, eh, uh, just, don't use those expressions. In the long run, that, that just, it doesn't sound good really in any context. Uh, and now a lot of people will say this centers around. So if you look up people's, I've, I've looked up a, a lot of professors' goals. Now we say my research centers around, this is an actual one that I've taken. This isn't the person, this is just like a clip art person. Uh, but because um, I didn't want to put the actual person who said this, but but you, you go to a university website and you look at how professors are saying my research centers around sport related musculoskeletal uh, injury prevention. Center is a center. It, it, you can't encompass anything with a center. Nothing centers around. It centers on. Okay, centers on. That's that's okay. You, you can you can center on some. You can't center around. Um, this is Terry Goodkind. He's an author I never liked, and he recently died. So I I don't want. I mean, recently like weeks ago or something. And so I don't want to say anything too. Oh, you know, in opposition to his legacy, but he was this fantasy author who who would you know like Lord of the Rings and Game of Thrones, Song of Ice and Fire, and and, and you know that sort of domain. But his were I was just I thought they were like all bad, but he made fun of everybody else. That that was his approach was was I'm going to make fun of everybody else. <clears throat> to try to, that's what really insecure people usually do is, is the first thing they do is attack. They go on the attack. Like, whoa, why are you attacking? What's, 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 it's the monster truck uh, complex, right? So you know, he was asked, this is a quotation in an interview, what authors do you read yourself? He said, there's actually very little to read today because more and more books center around characters who are either unremarkable, pathetic, or reprehensible. Very good kind. And the, the, so the, he has, He's mocking all of the other writers in a particular genre uh, while he himself is incorporating uh, a grammatical error, a, a, a inappropriate definition of a word. So he, he has, he's writing erroneously while making fun of other people. That, that was my issue with um, epic fail. Like what that, that's that, like both words are wrong there. Both words, that's a complete sentence and, and the every word in that sentence is, is grammatically nonsense. You don't get to make fun of other people. Um, in order, you never need the word in order in a sentence. It's, it's equivalent to basically, now I, I, earlier in this lecture, I said basically to say that I am basically in a recumbent bike. You know, I'm not actually in a, in a recumbent bike right now, but my posture can be likened to that which sits in a recumbent bike. That just sounded too strenuous. So I said, ah, I'm basically in a recumbent bike. Now, words like basically, usually in language can just be purged. They can, they can just be eliminated. And in order, 
uh, you can usually eliminate that and the sentence doesn't change. Kitty corner, not an expression. Uh, so it's if you say kitty corner, what people mean by that is it's across the street diagonally, or it, it's like an intersection. And at this diagonal angle across the intersection, that's what people mean by kitty corner, but quatra corner uh, is, is what, what the original expression was, which is shortened to catty corner. And then everyone thought it was about cats. And like, oh, you know, kittens are cuter than cats. Let's call it kitty corner. It has nothing to do with cats, right? The kitty corner is not an expression. It just sounds ludicrous. There was a time apparently when asparagus was difficult to say, and people were calling it sparrow grass. I, but there's a it's sort of a classism if, if for the people who are calling it sparrow grass like that's not what it is and not, neither is a kitty corner the kitty corner folks were the sparrow grass folks and then people realize like okay let's just call it what it is asparagus and we should also call this you know caddy or quatra corner because it has nothing to do with cats or kittens or whatever by and large this is one if you pay attention you'll encounter this i doubt you say it but i encounter this at least once a month people saying by and large, not from students, but but in uh, writing, in whether it's scientific publications, in uh, communication online, you'll, you'll encounter this. And it's a nautical term, it's a sailing term, and it means with and against the wind. By is against the wind, and with is large the wind. And so it just, it means that we could go in either direction here. So, so appropriate, we'd be like, you know, we just got a $4 million grant to reduce inner city crime in Stockton. How do we want to move this forward? Do you want to focus on police or education, parks, after school resources? What do we want to spend the money on? You know, the conditions are so dire here in Stockton. I mean, resources are just lacking in so many directions. I feel like we could go by and large with this one and, and the dividends will be, will be massive. It'll pay off. That's grammatical. Um, but if you say something like, it, it doesn't mean all encompassing, it, right? It means sort of in either direction. Um, you know, this year's Grammy Awards were by and large a total travesty. <sighs> or parenting is by and large a thankless profession. That's not, that's not what it means. And if you just get rid of by and large, parenting is a thankless profession, that's better. That's a better sentence. It's short, it's to the point, it means what people think it means. It's easier to read. Uh, you don't lose the reader at any point. This year's Grammy Awards were a total travesty. That's a better sentence. It's much better written. People are just shoehorning in this, like by and large, where, where it doesn't belong. Um, the Walking Dead did it too. And so season three, episode three, about 20 minutes in. Are you military? Hardly. A couple of vets, by and large, were self-trained. That's not what it means, right? And so you're going to encounter these expressions that, you know, whether it's per se or by and large, it's not even close to, to what that means and, and making sure you use it <clears throat> correctly. Now, due to, when people say, oh, this is due to that. Now, here's my huge rant in 2016, where I just, I used too much for a sidebar comment. And so I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to type it out here. And the distinction between due to and owing to. Now, they're very close. They mean almost the same thing. But I've never seen a student until I correct them say owing to. They always say due to. And I will hear due to in scientific writing as much as 20 times on a page. You know, this is due to that, which is due to this. And the next sentence due to this, which is due to that. And all this is due to, like, stop. I, it, it, it gets so difficult to read that I just sort of stop reading. And there's a lot of different ways to express things. But due to, you, you should be able to replace it by caused by. Owing to, remember the difference between continuous and continual? You just want to get that right. Uh, it's going to eliminate repetition if you get those words right. Uh, where continuous is this unending and continual is repeating. These two are also very close, but there, there is a distinction. So due to is caused by, owing to is because of. So he forfeited the game due to injury. He forfeited the game caused by injury. No, he forfeited the game because of injury. He forfeited the game owing to injury. That would be correct. The financial situation was owing to poor administrative decisions. It was caused by poor administrative decisions. Now, maybe because of, but caused by is more appropriate there. But usually, most due-tos are actually owing-tos uh, as you go through your writing. 
And when you see stuff like four variables spelled out and eight numerically significant outcomes in, in successive paragraphs, what well, just be consistent here. You know, this was three days a week or two days a week or whatever it is, and and five days per week, and and the pers and the a's in the same sentence. This is a different person, but be consistent. And so parallelism or consistency, just just make sure you write everything in the most with no potholes in it you want to eliminate potholes and there's any number of of things you can do to make your work more compelling brevity and clarity are are about as good as it gets brevity and clarity um, but those are hard work to be brief, to be clear, to be understandable, that is, is compelling. Jerry Seinfeld had this line a really long time ago about what is funny. And his answer was the answer to what is good writing, which is, I don't know, I have something that's in my head. I have an image, a scene in my head. And through the use of language, I recreate that scene perfectly in your head. For some reason, that's funny. That was Jerry Seinfeld's definition of humor, and I would disagree on, on humor, but he's the, clearly the expert. I mean, he's, he's the richest comedian who's ever lived. And but his definition, I would say, is one of the best definitions of writing, where you take an idea that's in your head and you recreate that exact idea in, in someone else's head. That is is the clarity piece, but be, in, or, in order, right, you should, uh, remove that, to do it, as briefly as possible to put as many calories into that dish as you can. So you're not just ramming fiber into their mouth. You want every word to have a caloric content to serve uh, a, a purpose in there because everything else is a, is, a, is a waste of time. And calories, that's what you want. You, you want prescription of the information. You want replication, accuracy. And you get the idea with, with what compelling work is. It's just more stuff about, about making work compelling. Stuff like this, dear recruiting representative, my name is, well, I removed the names here. I'm, I'm gonna de-identify all of these things, but the rest of it was, was accurate. And all of this can be inferred. You, you, can, you can already say what all of this stuff is. And this is the line about, yeah, you make it have calories in it. Henry Miller's Tropic of Cancer, well written, and and uh, this idea of put calories in the writing. Don't just fill it with roughage. Don't fill it with fiber. None of this. You could delete this entire thing and just start with something interesting, something compelling. Waste no words. If it can be inferred, it can be eliminated, decimated. Right? Decimate. Kill one out of every ten of your own. That's what you should be doing with your writing. The delete key. That's decimation, uh, and you're you're deleting you know, one out of every ten words to get to your right Twitter length of all of these things. And so, if there's a sentence, if there's a passage, a paragraph, a page, anything, and it's not contributing in a meaningful, effective way, fire it. Get rid of it. I could go another month with all of these things. And there's just sort of no point. You can, you can watch the, the I mean, you know a lot of this stuff, you know, individuals and you know, measures when, when measurements would be better. And, and uh, but you should start to recognize a lot of these errors in other people's writing. And as you do your own writing, you can recognize your own uh, misuses of, of words or grammatical errors, weird diction, areas of improvements. And, and this is another uh, one that I, you know, cutting edge and groundbreaking. Uh, just only use that to describe the shovel that's penetrating the earth. I, when it's a supplement or it's a workout routine. It is neither cutting edge nor groundbreaking. None of those things, none of those things are. Now, English. This is an evolving language. English is a really confusing language, really hard to learn if you haven't grown up with it. If you weren't born with English in the house, ah, oh, this language is tough. I mean, there are, now I'm horrible at other languages and that is just because I, maybe I don't try or just my brain is wired for, for a way like, you know what, English is, was hard enough. I'm not, I'm not going to try. You know, I, I tried French for a while. I did Japanese in school for four years. I just never got good at any of them. And 
English, though, is just so weird of a language, and it's always adapting, but never use a Webster's dictionary. If you see the word Webster on it, ignore that. If you're, you're like giving a, a wedding toast or speech or something, you're the you're a bridesmaid or a best man or whatever, a best woman or a bridesman or something, and you're giving something according to Webster's dictionary. That's it's not. Don't don't do that. It just I, the the literate half of the audience. Will, uh, that's how we're starting this with a cliche and the wrong dictionary. Webster. This is a descriptive dictionary. It just says how people use words. This is like a WWF or WWE or WCW, whatever it is. World Wrestling entertainment whatever you know the the fake wrestling where those refs just don't really notice anything and they, it's more just they're there for a presence that's what webster's is it's a descriptive dictionary it describes how people are misusing words that's all webster's is not isn't a real dictionary oxford english dictionary this is a prescriptive dictionary it prescribes things here's how it should be used here's the actual meaning of that word webster just says here's how people misuse words all the time and it just describes things. It's like a qualitative researcher just saying, okay, I'm observing, I'm putting it in their words. Hmm, don't do that. Use Oxford English Dictionary. Languages need referees. Sports that don't have refs cheat. The athletes cheat. And sports that don't have refs and umpires, uh, they don't exist anymore. All of the big sports, you know, baseball, basketball, football, hockey, soccer, and, and you start getting to you go down, down, down the list. And it, it, there's refs, there's umps, there's rules, there's rule makers, there's, there's sort of law abiding players and people to enforce those laws. For English, languages go dead all the time. Today, I'm sure some new language, the last speaker of a language, some indigenous language somewhere died and nobody speaks that language now. Languages go dead all the time. Some languages thrive. Those thriving languages have rules. If they didn't, they too would go dead. Now, English as a living, evolving language. Uh, your last lecture, we were talking about Shakespeare. Shakespeare came up and, and I said, well, you know, the, the closest to Shakespeare's pronunciation is probably the American Midwest. And uh, but there's not really nobody talks now like they did in Shakespeare's age and, I, and 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 what I said was assonance right the the repetition of vowel sounds uh, as opposed to alliteration repetition of consonant sounds um, we change the sound of our vowels all the time and and then I said you know the English pronunciation is is not that's not how Shakespeare spoke it's when, when you watch these uh, medieval fantasy shows whether it's you know, like the witcher or which I couldn't make it through I love fantasy and I just I tried to watch the witcher like six times and I'm still on like the second episode because I couldn't get past the bad writing but um the the, the accent that they always have is this English accent and you can tell because in America where do we drop our R's you know which is which is like you know mock Van Ness you know you know the the English accent um where the the, the dropped R's the sort of soft A's and, and dropped R's where do they do that uh east port towns like Boston ah it's uh, pocket car it's like that thing where, where they drop all the R's and sometimes for, for some reason they add R's to like machines but um, at the port towns, right? The, now the accent didn't invade the entire United States. It changed in England and then migrated to, to the port towns. So goes the, the histories of these. There's other explanations too, not just that the English were pissed at the US for their independence. Um, there's, there's a lot of explanations of how languages change over time and they continuously uh, change. They don't repeatedly, they're constantly undergoing uh, change. But one thing, a change that was actually good, which makes it hard when you're reading old language, if you, if you incorporate assonance, uh, it's not gonna be poetic. You know, Shakespeare isn't as poetic today as it was in his time because the words just don't, you know, we, we don't pronounce those vowels like we used to. Now, the, the space after a period, you'll probably notice that I always put two spaces after a period. Right here, you see two spaces after a period. And there's a reason that I do it, and there's a reason I don't in scientific literature. If I'm, if I'm submitting a journal article to a journal, if I'm submitting something, I don't do two spaces because that's not what, what we call for today. In this, in the kind of style guides, and and but to me, it's much more aesthetic. And you can go back to the history of language, and 
what used to exist was scriptio continua, and that's how we speak. Notice during this sentence, as I'm saying these words, there are no spaces between any of my words. It is scriptio continua until I take a breath. There's a little pause, there's a space, and then I keep talking and it looks just like this except it's coming out of my mouth. So originally in writing, that's what people did because that's how we talk. And talking existed for an awfully long time in the, in the, in the books that, that try to estimate the history of written language relative to spoken language. They always put it on a calendar and say January 1st to December 31st. That's a calendar year. January 1st is when we introduce language. Snake, fire, rain, danger, food. Wait, you, you introduce kind of mouth noises and with 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 communication to uh, you know, assigned to them and then december 31st that that's when we created written language and so written language is young we are able to understand spoken language so much so much faster than we can read which is why i can talk fast and you can hear my words but nobody can read this fast uh, i'll do audible books at double speed sometimes triple speed if i think the narrator is slow i cannot read that fast i cannot read at the, at the same speed i can listen that's selective pressures evolutionary advantages of of, of oral communication but originally we had scriptio continua and you just have to memorize stuff in advance because it is nearly impossible to read scriptio continua without any amount it's difficult you sort of stumble over those words now in the typewriter days of the typewriter ding, 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 you know you know the little like when people are that sounded nothing like a typewriter but uh, the amount of space that every single character occupied was the exact same you know mono spaced font we have proportional fonts now right i there are 10 i's there are 10 w's and so when you have these proportional fonts it's okay to go um, period space space and and you can give these visual cues of where the language goes, of when to pause, when to breathe, when to blink, and when to have your inflection you know, hit a word. And, and so we have visual cues that you don't actually need two spaces. I still think it's prettier to have the two spaces. And I read things better when we do. Now, it's not just English that has changing uh, language like this. In Burmese words, every single syllable, you have a space after that. That's a little bit much. I think right? that's that's taking that that's one step past what I find aesthetic and what I find more readable where I can actually read things faster if there's two spaces after a period I, it, it takes me less time um, to get to the end of the page fewer minutes less time remember the distinction between less and fewer but <clears throat> for that is sort of an aesthetic one okay we've been I've been hammering on what to do and, and what, what not to do. And again, uh, things change. So what I've said today, there are movements that, that are constantly on the march. And like the word literally, I talked about this last time, where uh, we know what literate means, we know what literacy means, but for some reason literally now means figuratively. It, it has nothing to do with literature and literate and and so one cannot literally go apeshit. That, that's not what the word means. But in another 30 or 40, 50 years, okay, maybe you can literally shit a brick and literally go apeshit and literally do other things. The shit literally hits the fan or, or whatever. But today, don't do it. Because uh, what I said last time, it's better to be behind the curve in this. It's much better to be behind the curve than ahead of it in matters of grammar and communication. And, and this next section is going to be more what to do. Usage and abusage, the best book that's ever been written on on what not to do all the mistakes and a lot of what what I've been talking about came from usage and abusage what I'm about to start talking about Mark Forsyth is is one of the best writers on this but there's a ton of really good material I mean this is I don't know an eighth of the books that I've read on this particular subject but these are the ones that I would recommend the, these are sort of the top ones, uh, the, the top books that, that I would say, if you're interested in, in improving the use of, of English and language, those were, I think, the best ones. Uh, Bill Bryson wrote, if, if you want an introductory, the, the quickest introductory book 
uh, a dictionary of troublesome words by Bill Bryson is good, but it's essentially just a plagiarism beginning to end of usage and abusage. It's a good parts version, what Princess Bride did, you know, um, not literally did, you know, by S. Morgan Stern, um, the good parts version. But but pretending pretending that it was that it was a, a good part not a, not a literal purge of words. Okay, so words go in a specific order. Whenever you're going to describe things, so J.R.R. Tolkien uh, was talking about. Uh, my mother said nothing about the dragon, but pointed out that one could not say a green great dragon, but had to say a great green dragon. I wondered why and still do. So this is J.R.R. Tolkien, right? This is Lord of the Rings guy. And words go in a specific order. And uh, you don't have to memorize the order. This is the order that they go in. It has to end with a noun. Dragon has to go at, at, the, at the end. But this is the order that words go in. And it just sounds weird if you put them in another order and you're a native speaker, if you grew up with English. It's like listening to music and hearing a wrong note. It's hard to put that into, it's hard to explain that. It's, it's hard to express why that note is bad. Well, no, it's the frequency was inconsistent. You know, I was expecting the perfect fifth and what I got. What you know, it, it, It's hard to explain those things, but everyone knows what the wrong note sounds like. That's essentially what this is. It's, it's just this, this wrong note in English and you can do that one just fine. Now, hyperbaton, this is you're putting words in a weird order. Hyperbaton, you put words in, in a weird order. You have to master English first before you can do that. And so stone walls do not a prison make. He talks like Yoda. And Richard Loveless is how, is how you pronounce it. And it was in the 16th, 17th century, 1600s. And you have to master English. Picasso rearranged body parts. I mean, the face and there's, there's you know, a shoulder coming out of the ear. So we can all recognize that it is a person, but it doesn't look anything like a person. But if, if you go to his early career, he mastered realism first and then started doing the artistic equivalent of hyperbaton. He started putting his his words, his, his uh, visual art words in the wrong order. Okay, so let's get to Yoda. Um, anadiplosis, this is a very effective, very memorable way of communicating. And you can tell what, what it is. You, you just, you, the last word of, of one clause begins the next clause and you have three clauses. Now I'll talk about what a tricolon is, this, you have, you have three whatever things, uh, you have three examples, three whatevers, and the importance of three. You don't want it to be two, you don't want it to be four, I'll get there. But for an anadiplosis, um, fear leads to anger. I'm not going to do the Yoda voice, you can do Yoda's voice in your head. Fear leads to anger, anger leads to hatred, hatred leads to suffering. Now if he had just said, oh, fear makes you mad and, and hateful and, and you start suffering. That's, that's not memorable. Nobody would be quoting that. Anadiplosis is the reason that we quote this thing. So, but, but if you can just keep continuing, right? This is Jesse Jackson. So fear leads to anger, anger leads to hatred, hatred leads to suffering, suffering breeds character, character breeds faith, in the end, faith will not disappoint. It, it, these things are all gibberish. None of them make any sense, but they're so powerful, right? These things get quoted again and again and again. Yo, Yoda has his quoted line as though it's deep wisdom. Jesse Jackson, good line. That is a really good line. Is it true? No, no, it's not even close to true. But but it's a really good, memorable line, and people people chant it like wisdom. And uh, yeah, it's really good writing. But why is it good writing? Because anadiplosis. It's not good writing because it's gibberish, right? You just start connecting these things, and you can get another one that, that talks about disappointment. And, and, and these these things just go, go on and on. It's anadiplosis is what matters, not the actual language. And so you can just put up, make up anything you want, and and structure it correctly structure it according to these these uh figures of of rhetoric and you're going to have what people would regard as good writing even if the writing itself isn't particularly good right the storytelling is bad but but man can you express it now diacopy is we all know uh james bond let's fast forward whatever this is there's sylvia trench the good line is coming up. 
let's go a little farther forward. I hope you can hear some of this. We're not there yet. Okay, so that's diacopy, where Bond, James Bond, this is the uh, one list of the 100 greatest movie quotes, right, should be quotation, quote is a verb, quotation is the noun, so 100 greatest movie quotations of all time. Number 22 is Bond, James Bond. I'll get to why that's so interesting in just a second, or I guess a second has just elapsed. This is what Ian Fleming, who wrote the James Bond you know, books said, I wanted the simplest, dullest, plainest sounding name I could find. James Bond was much be better than something more interesting like Peregrine Carruthers. Exotic things would happen to and around him, but he wanted, uh, but he would be a neutral figure, an anonymous blunt instrument wielded by government uh, department. So this is the simplest, dullest, plainest sounding name he could come up with. And what was number 22, I think, of the greatest movie quotations of all time was a, a dull name stated, but Bond, James Bond, incorporates diacopy, right? X, Y, X, a word, put in a word or two in the middle. It's a sandwich, right? And then close it. You, you, you begin and end with the Oreo crust or the bread crust or, or whatever. Uh, and so, you know, Sunday, bloody Sunday, from sea to shining sea, oh, captain, my captain, uh, to be or not to be. These are all examples of diacopy. And uh, meter, uh, just read your sentences out loud. You have to read your sentences out loud as you're writing. You don't have to know um, how rhythm works. And sometimes these words, right, there are stresses, there's a cadence. So um, rebels rebel, right? So we were pronouncing words in a, in a weird way. And just listen to somebody who doesn't know how to construct lyrics and they sing them and the accents are on the wrong words. Um, it just sounds horrible. It sounds like a beginner's uh, lyrical construction if they if they don't understand how meter works, how, how the beats work, and and what accents fall and on what syllables and in, in language. But just read your sentences out loud. And if you start stumbling, if there's too much sort of glossal gymnastics, right? Your tongue is sort of dancing around and you know staggering over your teeth. Uh, you need to rephrase these things. So, um, uh, isocolon, I don't really like this one that much, but roses are red, violets are blue. Float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. Um, where you just have these two uh, separate clauses, one right after another with this parallel structure. Um, chiasmus, this one is fascinating. And you can use this, you can use this in, in really any context and people remember what you said. So Hillary Clinton in 2008. In the end, the truest test is not the speeches a president delivers, it's whether the president delivers on those speeches. So we have an optic chiasm. That's where the optic nerves coming from your eyes, optic, right, uh, in the brain, they cross. That's what this is, chiasmus. It's this crossing uh, of these images. And so Joseph Kennedy, that's John Kennedy's dad, John F. Kennedy's dad, when the going gets tough, the tough get going, right? That's chiasmus. John F. Kennedy, his kid, picked up on that. Ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. You're just inverting the sentence. Um, but it, it would be so boring if he just said something like, you know, countries could probably help you out um, but but is there something that you can do? You know, if, if you try to phrase these things without the chiasmus, nobody would repeat this. So Bill Clinton in 2008, and then I just, when I was listening to Joe Biden's, um, oh man, John's dad, I, I didn't, that this must be there, although he's practically that old. Uh, I copied and pasted in the old one as I put in Joe Biden. And so ign ignore John F. Kennedy's dad as the Joe Biden uh, is serving in that role too. Uh, not only is he president, he's the father of a, of a previous president who died a really long time ago. So Bill Clinton, 2008, people are more impressed by the power of our example than the example of our power. Now, what he's saying is if we conduct ourselves morally, you know, rather than rushing into war, people are going to be inspired. But that's not memorable, right? And the, Joe Biden picked up on that. And, and when I was watching his, his you know, acceptance speech, although he hasn't, <laughs> Trump, Trump is refusing to let go of that, of that rope. But, and we lead not by the example of our power, 
but by the power of our example. Okay, Bill Clinton said almost the exact same thing in 2008. I mean, all, practically word for word. Uh, but it's it's a powerful sentence, right? Let's incorporate power. And uh, but it's because of chiasmus that it's that it that it is memorable. So Barack Obama, you stood up for America. Now America must stand up for you. Chiasmus, right? Mitt Romney, um, 2007. Freedom requires religion, just as religion requires freedom. It's just chiasmus. Most of these things are gibberish. Most of these things are total nonsense. Uh, but you incorporate chiasmus and it becomes memorable. You know, whether we bring our enemies to justice or bring justice to our enemies, justice will be done. Um, John F. Kennedy again, right? He really learned from his dad, Biden. Uh, mankind must put an end to war or war will put an end to mankind. It is not memorable to say war is going to kill us. Ah, That's not memorable. Chiasmus is memorable. And so there are certain devices, uh, these little literary devices that you can incorporate in your own writing. And yes, it works in scientific writing uh, that will make it memorable where people will quote you, will quote your quotation. And uh, it seems like you have a, a, a better grasp on language, it's just like in music, you learn a few tricks, or in chess, right? You learn a few, you learn the Rui Lopez, or you, you learn some specific opening and suddenly you look like a pro. Uh, so other example, eat to live, not live to eat, one for all, for one, you know, tea for two, two for tea. This is just all chiasmus. Uh, you know, beauty is truth and truth is beauty. All okay, <laughs> mind on my money and my money on my mind. I, I mean, that's total ridiculous nonsense gibberish, but uh, so many people know the line. Um, and so let's get back into Game of Thrones. My husband is my king. It's the Tyrell lady. I, I, don't, I don't remember her first name. Whatever it is. The, the, the Tyrell daughter. My husband is my king. And my king is my husband. There's symmetry there, right? That's that's chiasmus. And in Taming of the Shrew, let's go, let's go back to Shakespeare. It's like the exact same line. So I'm pretty sure George R.R. R. Martin did a lot of studying of, of Shakespeare before he did his own uh, writing, before he did uh, Song of Ice and Fire, where uh, my husband is my lord and my lord is my husband or my husband, my lord. It's something, it's something like that. It's very similar in, in Taming of the Shrew. And so, but it's chiasmus is the reason these things are, are memorable. Um, yeah, I'm married to the king. That's not that's not memorable. Um, and then, like Magic: The Gathering, you know, there's little, the playing cards, where there's good writing on these things. Uh, he knows the name of every elf born in the last four centuries. More importantly, they all know his. It's sort of an extension on chiasmus. Um, sometimes you go to hell, and sometimes hell comes to you. Great lines, right? Those are great lines. Why are they great lines? Chiasmus. Only reason. Only reason. Those things are are great. And so, in the fantasy world of all of this stuff, whether it's Lord of the Rings, Game of Thrones. I mean, you just saw the Game of Thrones one. Shakespeare is fantasy too. I, anyone who says otherwise is, doesn't really have a history of, of kind of uh, you know, literature. Um, but we love we love symmetrical things, averageness. So, so this 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 attractiveness and sexual selection of symmetry and averageness. Nothing says ex um, uh, sexy like like you know normality or normalcy, right, which isn't a word, but symmetry, we love symmetrical things. Now, when it gets too symmetrical, when things get a little bit too symmetrical, it sort of feels like it's cheating, which is the palindrome. Uh, Madam, I'm Adam, backwards, right? Madam, I'm, I'm Adam, or like a race car, backwards race car. It starts to feel like it's cheating a little bit. This is the, I'll, I'll end on this story of 15 years ago, roughly 15 years ago, I was, I did some traveling for a while and stamped a, uh, a bunch of, of you know, got a bunch of stamps on my passport. And there was one location where I was, I don't want to say where, where I was, because I don't want this to somehow be perceived as, as like a cultural thing. Um, but there's some location where, where everywhere I went, it was just billboard after billboard after billboard and pamphlet after pamphlet after pamphlet of whitening creams, of skin hue lightning creams. I thought it was it was weird. And I was there with this guy, Dave, and I was like, why, why is every st advertisement about some cream that's like bleaching skin and stuff? It's like, whoa, there's, there's a, there's not like a caste system, but there's, there's a sort of social hierarchy with, with the pigmentation and sort of the hypo pigmentation has this, has this hierarchy. And then we were down in the subway and I saw an albino and I was fascinated because he was there, like by his lonesome, looking really sad, and and everybody was like shaming. It was really, it was almost creepy. 
And I asked Dave, the guy next to me, I'm not saying Dave is like a cultural expert. Nobody named Dave is, is a cultural expert. But, uh, maybe, other than maybe like Dave Chappelle, who has some great observations. But, but uh, Dave, what is going on? You'd think that guy would be like king of the world. I mean, he's it's just, I mean, he looks, there's nothing more pasty. And, and right above him is an advert. I mean, it's precisely, I'm not, I'm not making this up, above him was like some sign for a skin whitening cream and he was just being like shamed it's like oh he's cheating <laughs> like that's that was like he's like yeah it's sort of too perfect he's cheating and so that's what a palindrome is to me um and if you've ever seen the movie da vinci code which i, I don't really like and i the book was just a, a it was another dan brown one which i don't really care for dan brown's writing other than masterful storytelling the guy who played the albino was not an albino and i think today if that were to come out there there may be a little bit of social commentary some qualitative analyses and and if this last minute of of commentary offers anything it's is that i i um I am maybe not the most equipped person to talk about social commentary, but the point is symmetry. We love super symmetrical things, but it can sound like it's cheating if, if it's just forced symmetry, way over the top symmetry. It, it can start to feel false, like we're being duped. You're pulling a fast one over on us. And I'll end there. Uh, for things to do. And then I'll just, uh, for next lecture, I might pick up a few more of these literary devices and these sort of little rhetorical devices that you can incorporate in your writing. And then the test is on Friday. And I'll also do some questions and answers on Wednesday if you have them. So maybe I'll finish this up, this little section, and then the rest of the time we'll do, we'll do Q&A to get you ready for Friday's exam. All right, I'll see everyone. Oh, yeah. um, oh, was there a question? Sorry, yeah, just for the group for our research project, we were just doing some work for the poster and we realized that we didn't have the exact data we needed to tailor to our question. So we kind of tweaked our question. Totally fine. Okay, did we have to tell you the new question or was it okay if we just changed it? No, okay. just I, I, assume, I assume multiple people are gonna tailor their question as they find the data that are available. Uh, they're like, ah, this isn't what I was hoping to, to ask. And even if you start analyzing, like this isn't at all what I was expecting to find, you can, you can, you can steer and you can hop on a different road. You, you can, you can like, let me just take the exit here and, and let me turn around again on this highway instead. Totally fine, you, you can do that. Uh, the idea of, of all of this, you know, let's get the executive summary in early. Let's, you know, all, all of these um, IRB forms, these exercises were, were to try to make as much progress as possible early. So it's not just cram, cram, cram. Uh, I'm, I hate this uh, for right at the end of the semester, ending the semester with, with kind of hatred is that's not where I want to be I want to end the semester with oh that was enjoyable in the end it was sort of stressful for a while there and in the end it wasn't that bad that's how I like to end it and people will so I try to encourage let's get started early but at the end of, you know, of, of the project like ah just this isn't working out for me yeah just just steer just steer it somewhere else okay thank you yeah slides Okay, comment box, chat box is open. As always, just let me know if you have a question as we're going mute otherwise, um, so that we don't have the, the background of whatever your uh, multitasking verbs are. But if you have questions, let me know, put them in the, in the chat box, whatever. So today is National Princess Day and it's fine to you know, honor our imaginations a little bit, but today is also, this is Jim Jones down here, today is also the anniversary of Jim Jones, of that mass, you know, like murder slash suicide slash extinction of the People's Temple uh, 1978, that, that was like everybody drinks the, what we say is Kool-Aid, but I think it was actually Gatorade, or uh, not Gatorade, uh, Flavorade and the cyanide flavorade mass extinction. So it's today what we're going to be doing is merging 
these two worlds, well, at the end of the lecture, we're going to assimilate the imagination of National Princess Day and the reality, that sort of grimy reality of the Jim Jones narrative. Uh, and we'll, we'll get there um, at the end. But uh, remember the exam is on Friday. And it's conceptual. You can't memorize that stuff. You just have to know it. Uh, and so it, it takes practice. It takes practice for these things. And uh, this is the best practice that you can do for them. Uh, these are all of the analyses you'll be held accountable for, both in terms of uh, reading the outputs as well as understanding contexts in which to run them. Here's where you find that stuff in the slideshows. So the slideshows, the exact minute of, of where you find those, give or take a few seconds, um, that's where you'll find them. The review slides are posted. Make sure you've, you've been going through those. Uh, lab three is also um, due, so make sure you do that. Now, a little, you know, every five or six lectures or so, I do, I do my, my pep talk. And it, you know this well, because we, we go through these analyses after every single exam we do. I mean, not just the big one. I mean, anytime I have an exam in any class, I analyze them. I do a bunch of regression modeling to figure out exactly what behaviors and what characteristics are scientifically supported so I can pass advice along to you. Some of what I pass along is qualitative. You know, I ask every, like all the, all the highest scoring students what their strategy was and I, I report those strategies. So there's a qualitative component, component. but I do a quantitative assessment of every test and the breakdowns and, and regression analyses. And I don't stop doing that once you graduate. Uh, we collect tons of data on students and so we can do predictions of student success. We can do predictions of, of do students enter the job market? What, what is their, um, uh, you know, are they unemployed? Are they in grad school? Are they physical therapists? Are they MDs? We, we keep data on all of these students. And this is a set of analyses I didn't do. Um, this is Farley and Sharmila in the econ department here at Pacific. And they ran a logistic regression on on incoming students matriculating students incoming and looking at the difference between legacy and, and non legacy so you know do you have a, a history a family history here and, and are you from California or are you are you being imported from elsewhere and are you pre health or are you in some other major and looking at um, holding all of these variables constant, sex constant, SAT constant, uh, type of major constant, high school GPA. We have data on all of this stuff. And um, looking at, well, what should tuition be, right? So from an economics perspective, that's what people are looking at is, is the professors who, who uh, are looking at dollars as a variable. Now, what I'm more interested in, you can interpret this stuff, you know what an odds ratio is, there's the p-value, there's a 95% confidence interval, you know all this stuff is held constant, you know how to read, here's your table one up here, 2015, 16, 17. Now they have thousands of students they're analyzing thousands of students across those three years. Pretty, pretty compelling logistic regression, which essentially says we should be lowering t tuition um, if, if we want to, uh, you know, continue to be a, a thriving university. But I don't have thousands of students who I look at, um, but I don't stop analyzing at graduation because mm -hmm. I want to structure my lectures. I want to um, my advice that I give you, I want it to be scientifically backed. I want to prepare you for what comes next as you matriculate into life, which is way harder than I am. Life is way harder than I am. Life is meaner than any chemistry professor you've ever had. Life is, is much harder. And I have a, a, a growing database. You know, we keep tabs on, on everybody. I've been here teaching for six graduations, right? I have I had six of my groups of students uh, graduate now. And to put in perspective how many students that is, we have 408 current students. And I've been through six graduations. And this is the number of, of letters of rec that I've written. I put them all in this folder. So, you know, I've written over 450 letters of recommendation for students and, and gone through six graduations and watched these students go into those next steps 
of life. And the most harmful practice, this sounds weird, I'm telling you it's the truth. The most harmful practice is focusing on the exam of saying, is this material, am I going to be tested on this? And that is, is prohibitive to learning. It's, it's exclusive to the intake uh, and, and putting into circulation of, of all the information that could be very valuable. So what I'm talking about today, no, you're not tested on it. But, you know, the, the question as it's asked, will this be on the test? Um, you can control for these variables in, in regression analyses and whether it's logistic of do you uh, enter the workforce, did you get into graduate school or what's your earning potential isn't something we have data on or at least it's not something I have data on. But my analyses all show that that's among the most harmful practices a student can have, the most harmful mindsets a student can have. But it actually, intuition is sufficient here. You don't need data because it's sort of obvious if you just think about it. Um, machines you know, phones and computers and calculators and machines are really good at machine verbs and they can memorize and and plagiarize and and you can work as hard as you want in life you could dedicate the rest of your life to competing as a machine as an as an automaton as 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 this sort of uncreative uh memorizing for the test machine and you'll never be hired because every machine in the world is going to be better than you like a, a texas instrumentals calculator from 19 you know 92 or some get like a ti-85 or something from the 90s and that's going to be a better test memorizing device than i could ever be than you could ever be um but no machine in the world can compete with you on matters of creativity, on matters of imagination, on matters of originality. There's no machine that can compete with you in that. There's no machine uh, capable of compassion. No machine is capable of expressing empathy to a patient or, or to, a, to a friend or to a client. Uh, no machine uh, can construct clear, oh, original, articulate, expressive communication. Machines can't do any of those things. Uh, machines, they are not humane. You are humane. Uh, and and uh, there's at no point can a machine compete with you in creativity or clarity or compassion, like the three C's of, of humanity. And the job market, that's what they're looking for. People, no one on a hiring committee is like, oh, I want a machine because a calculator will be better. Hey, Siri, what's the answer to X? N nobody cares if a person has memorized something for the test because Siri and Alexa and Google Google, these will always be better. There's no way. It is not physically or, or, you know, cognitively, physiologically, in any perspective, is it possible for you to compete uh, with, with Siri on all these things? And so what you need to do in life to, to be successful, and this is backed by both data and sort of obvious, just like that's, that's what really qualitative is sufficient here, although the quantitative analyses support this. Don't study for tests. Don't um, try to be an automaton, allow yourself to learn, allow yourself to, to sort of absorb information that will help you in life. And one of the most useful things is going to be creativity, articulate communication, research, the stuff that we're talking about now, essentially what I'm talking about for the rest of today. Um, and what I talked about the, for the last two lectures are way more important. They make you way more employable than any test you're going to take because your employer doesn't care what percentage you got on a test. Your employer cares that you can do things that machines can't. And so that said, let's let's wrap up the uh, communication piece. Let's let's wrap up um, articulate expression, original communication, clarity, all of that, and then we'll do some questions and answers. And uh, it seems tough to get a job unless you have good grades. Yeah, well, there's sort of, yeah, sort of, uh, not entirely true. Uh, when you look at a lot of the people who just drop out when they when they get these really good uh, jobs and, and whether they're, I mean, just ask the, 
you know, the Bill Gateses and Steve Jobses of the world. Now they, they are outliers, they are exceptions. Uh, but grades, students, you know, I've, I've been doing this again for six graduations and people think grades matter in a way that they actually don't. You need a baseline threshold that you have to, to get across. Often um, there's a lot, even like look at our own PT program. Um, I watched in my maybe the second graduation that I was here. I watched a 3.9 student get rejected and a 2.8 student get accepted. Why? Well, there was um, community involvement and, and there was uh, research and there was, there was a lot of other things. And a whole point of GPA was thrown in, in the garbage and the, it was 3.8 something GPA and it was like a 2.82, something like that. The 2.8, this is our own PT school and that's not unusual. This is, this is normal, this is, this is what you see everywhere. And there's gonna be a minimum threshold that you have to meet. But the minimum threshold, uh, because of the resume, often it's the resume. Now, when you get into the interview, if, if you can't communicate clearly, you're out, right? If, if you get into the interview and then you don't get accepted, that's a, a problem with communication um, and clarity and, and, and you know, if you, if you go up and, and express things unclearly. And that is, I don't know, 20% of students, something like that, get, get rejected from the interviews. They make it in on, on all of the normal uh, variables and then they get rejected and it's it's a matter of the so 3.0 minimum GPA for grad school that's actually not true uh, almost everywhere yeah we say 3.0 and it's not true um, our own master's program if there's a student who has you know if they were an Olympian or and and you know they have an interesting perspective they have a Nobel laureate you can admit them with a 1.0 that's totally fine um, it's the same thing everywhere um, now there's there's paperwork I need to fill out uh, to do that, but everyone fills out that paperwork for exceptional students. Um, so this idea of 3.0 minimum, that's actually not true anywhere. That's not true at Harvard, that, that, that's not true anywhere. And now there are some schools that have uh, more strict admission guidelines, much more strict, uh, less fluid admission guidelines. But people get too hung up on stuff that really doesn't matter in the end. What matters, and I'm going to talk about this at the end, this is where I'm going to get to at the end, combining Jim Jones and National Princess Day of, of the playful narrative and, and the, the grimy reality as we assimilate these two, these two worlds, um, it's communication right? It is a minimum of, of academic thresholds that, that you have met. Now, if it's like you need 200 hours with contact hours with patients, you have to hit that, right? There's minimum thresholds. But the stuff that they really look at that outcompetes your peers, it doesn't matter if your GPA is half a point lower. Nobody cares what you got on some particular exam, especially your employer. Your employer has no idea and will never ask you what you got on some exam. Um, what they want is you to communicate clearly and know stuff. And if you have... Um, uh, publications that are advancing your field, you're getting raises, you're getting hired, your esteem is much higher than that of your peers. The stuff people think matters seldom matters anywhere near as much as they think. The stuff people ignore in college, uh, that's, man, that's the stuff that could have advanced them. And this is one of the major points. I'm not covering this information. I'm not testing you on it, but I'm not covering it pointlessly. It's some of the most in important information to set you up for success in your career. Right, to set you up in a higher tax bracket, to get you out of, you know, like look at the number of, of Pacific students who graduate and, and live beneath the poverty line for their entire life. It was really stunning. And how do we get you to avoid that? I'm using a scientifically from my sample backed approach. Now, there may be other samples in other departments or at other institutions or other time points um, chronologically 50 years ago, maybe things are very different. But in my scientific analyses, both quantitative and qualitative, I'm teaching what I have observed as the most important stuff and communication, clarity of communication is one of those most important things. And so definitely take notice of all of this because it will, it will be more important than most of what you learn uh, in most classes if you incorporate it and, and, and work hard at, at, at you know, succeeding at this. But a lot of that hard work is going to be revision, right? Clear writing is, is revision over and over and over and over. And you should make things shorter by revision, right? There's, there are tons of cliches about that, tons of, of great literature to sort of help you along. Um, John McCorder is probably the most articulate of all of these uh, linguists. Uh, usage and abusage is this is the standard dictionary of incorrect use. Uh, Mark Forsyth of, of sort of 
eloquence and, and art articulate communication, kind of one of the big names there. Now, we ended last one on chiasmus. Remember the symmetry stuff. We all love uh, symmetry. And so like pleasure's a sin and sometimes sin's a pleasure, right? So that's that's Lord Byron, that's, that's Don Juan, which is an epic, right? You know what an epic is. It's not like epic fail, right? That, that's, that's a grammar error. But um, this inversion of, of the, the uh, expression, what, what, what a chiasmus is, you know, the optic chiasm, how that works. Litotes, this is just, it's not that helpful, this one. Um, uh, chiasmus is much more helpful to, to use that for, for memorable uh, expressions. Litotes doesn't really matter. It's just a, uh, an understatement with a double negative. So if someone asks you, do these genes make me look fat? You say, well, you're not not fat or whatever. You don't look not fat. That's an understatement to say, well, maybe, but, but you're sort of, you're, you're, you're diminishing the blow or, you know, it's, it's, it's not unusual. There's a song that it's not unusual. I'm not going to sing it, but that just means it's usual, right? And so, you know, it's not uncommon. That means it's common. It's sort of a, a, an understatement. Sometimes people will overdo this and, um, and so, you know, not seldom, you just mean often, but, and so there, there's, a, there's an amount that people overdo this, and sometimes it's just gibberish, the Tempest, which is actually good, um, but, you know, I have no hope that he's undrowned, like, that's, that's gibberish, it's, that's hard to, to say, like, that's, you know, light toties, and, and, but it has to be an, an um, understatement to make it, to make it sort of fit, uh, otherwise it's just, like gibberish and assonance and alliteration i referenced this before assonance has a has a ring to it a, sort of a literal ring in terms of the repetition of vowel sounds but english changes over time this is sonnet 116 shakespeare's sonnet 116 prove and love those used to rhyme they don't rhyme anymore prove and love and so assonance changes and changes and changes it changes geographically uh it changes i mean go to um I don't know, Australia, you know, shy of my face, right? Every, every A is an I. Um, and like with a knife, right? If it's a knife, it's a noun. And so there's wherever you are, if you're in the American South, right? We're, we're pronouncing vowels differently. So assonance doesn't really work. Um, but, but we do see expressions based on it. And, and these have a, a, they're sort of ephemeral, right? There's a timestamp at, at which they'll expire. Um, and Shakespeare's already expired, you know, prove and love that already expired. But like nine lives, is six lives, 15 lives. The only reason it's nine is because of the assonance, right? Redhead like brown head and yellow head and whatever that doesn't like the hair color right um you know pulled pork whatever this is we're getting into into alliteration here um and high is a kite uh so again this is like high is a balloon that's not an expression because it doesn't have a a, a ring to it so assonance alliteration lasts year after year after year after year after year assonance expires uh, it doesn't expire as quickly as milk but it does it does expire with some haste uh, as language changes because consonants those sort of harsh consonant sounds tend to to have a longer shelf life um but schwa, this character, that's really how we pronounce a lot of things. And if you just listen to your self-talk or re-listen to this lecture or listen to what I'm saying as I, as I move forward, and it's a bunch of uh sound, assonance, like assonance and alliterations. Uh, uh, uh. It's not like, you know, assonance and, and stuff. Schwa is just this. It's, it's this um, little symbol uh, where as I'm reading the comment box of, of what schwa, this, this little uh, symbol where it's just uh, all vowel sounds sort of just become uh, um, another, you know, uh, uh, you know, it, it's not like another, you know, and, and alliteration, we don't really pronounce things. And so that also uh, hampers our, our ability to, to use assonance effectively because it's just a bunch of uh, uh, uh. Now, epistrophe, getting into some of the more uh, memorable lines um so i don't know if you can if you can hear it let me see if i can So the repetition, epistrophe, is this repetition. This is probably a very outdated, you know, like a sombrero with a bite out of it and everything. But it's a, it's a really famous quotation. Um, 
you know, again, this is, do you remember uh, Diacopy uh, with Bond, James Bond was number 22 on this AFI, um, this list of the, of the greatest musical quotations, not quotes, that's, that's inarticulate, but uh, quotations of all time. This is number 36. And let's ignore, uh, you know, sort of cultural sensitivities here. What I'm talking about is, uh, a very famous quotation, and it's an example of epistrophe, which is you end successive serial sentences or clauses in the same line. So like badges, we ain't got no badges, we don't need no badges, I don't have to show you any stinking badges, this, this uh, serial repetition. And Abe Lincoln did the exact same thing. This is the closing lines of the Gettysburg Address, um, the government of the people, by the people, for the people. Now, this is also an example of a tricolon, which you, everyone needs to know the tricolon, and we'll get there. It's this example of threes, using three things. Here's a, a quotation that, that Donald Trump certainly didn't say, but do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So ending these serial again, clauses or sentences, expressions in the same word. And we do this because it's memorable. Um, and uh, there are other ways to express these things without epistrophe and nobody would remember them. Um, and this is, I, I, this is a video that like I um, myself made, but uh, it's one of Donald Trump's recent speeches. I hope you can hear it. Um, Questions. He couldn't answer any of them. Couldn't answer the questions. He refuses to take questions. He never takes questions. I take questions. He never takes questions. So he said he, he ended six serial clauses in the word questions. He refused Biden to answer questions. He never takes questions. He, you know, he can't answer questions. I take questions. He never takes questions. I take questions. That is, is sort of an illiterate example of, of epistrophe, um, of just this, this repetition. Um, but a, a much more literate, articulate example of, of epistrophe and this sort of elongated version of it is Obama. This is his 2008, November 2008. So, you know, this month, a bunch of years ago, his, his uh, accepted a victory speech and has a sort of Bob the Builder theme of, of blah, 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 blah. Yes, we can. Blah, blah, blah. Yes, we can. Blah, blah. Yes, we can. Um, and if you know the Bob the Builder reference of the, can we build it? And, and yes, we can, says Obama. And so this is a sort of an extended epistrophe and everyone knows that, but people do this on purpose. People do this uh, very deliberately to make it memor uh, memorable, to make it effective. There, there are these these you know, the literary devices, these rhetorical devices that really make it work. There are tricks to incorporate in your writing that will be memorable, whether it's in one of your entrance essays or, or personal statements, or, or it's something you say in an interview or, or a manuscript or, or whatever it is that you're working on, using the rhetorical devices is very effective. And you'll encounter these uh, in film and in, in literature and, and famous lines. It's just it's this stuff. It's just a bunch of this stuff over and over. And so even in lyrics, right, blah, 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 something pizza pie in your eye, whatever, that's amore, you know, the song, the Dean Martin song, he didn't write it, I don't know who wrote it, um, blah, 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 too much wine, that's amore, you know the song, one of them's weird about like drooling into pasta, and then gets back to, like dancing on clouds and stuff, and so that's epistrophe, Lord of the Rings, right, Aragorn, when he's, he gives his big speech, you know, blah, 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 whatever, but it is not this day, and then a bunch of additional stuff, but it is not this day, right, so that's the, that's that's the Aragorn speech. It's epistrophe. So writers, people who are effective, people with, with literary agents, people who, who succeed in publishing, whether it's in the sciences or in fiction, they, they know these uh, rhetorical devices. This is part of entering the world of communication, sort of entering the grown-up world. This is really it, the, the taxpaying world of clear communication, effective communication, being memorable. Watch movies. Um, like the big blockbuster stuff, and you're going to encounter these lines. When there's a big line, you're going to encounter these things. Now, the opposite is is um, anaphora. Um, What's anaphora? This 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 uh, anaphora is instead of ending your your sentences in the in the same thing over and over, you just begin them. So we all know Ecclesiastes, right? A time to X and a time to Y, a time to Z and a time to ampersand, whatever, a, a time to do whatever, of beginning these these sentences 
um, oh, and, and you don't want to overdo it. Is it supposed to be bad for research? No, it seems good sometimes. Yeah, so you want to you want to finesse these. As I was reading the comment box, it, it, it seems good sometimes. That is perfect. This is really effective uh, when it's effective, right? So there there are times when uh, you punt, you know, or there are times when you do a Hail Mary. There are times when you, you know, but you, you don't punt all the over and over, just whenever you, the, the, the context, the situation has to call for it. And you don't want to use anaphora for fifth, uh, anaphora for like 50 minutes. Um, you know, cause then it's like, okay, this is just getting weird. Uh, but there, there are times at which this stuff becomes really quoted. I mean, everybody, it doesn't matter. I mean, what percentage of people have actually read Ecclesiastes, have like opened up the Bible and read it and, you know, gone through, um, you know, whatever youth groups or, 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 you know, Sunday school for enough years to have read these. I, I, almost nobody has actually like, let me just cover to cover this thing. Almost nobody. And and yet everybody knows Ecclesiastes. Find somebody who's 10 years old or older, and they've, they've heard about this. Can they quote it? Nah, no, probably. But we know the line. Why do we know the line? Anaphora, the line Z. That's what makes it, you know, there's a time to kill and heal and break down and build up and dance and mourn and, and gather some stones and, and refrain from some hugs. That's today, right? A time to refrain from embracing. That's, that, that, that's today. That's that time um, with quarantine. But that's not memorable, right? Anaphora makes it memorable, but you want to use it at the right time. Um, and so this is Winston Churchill. A, a, the speech would not be memorable, but this is a super famous speech. And it really, honestly, it just sucks. The speech is terrible. But it, the we shall not flag or fail speech. I mean, if you, if you haven't encountered this in some history class or some English class or, or, or I don't know if you've taken like rhetoric or, or what, if you haven't encountered this at some point in life, you will, we shall not flag or fail. We shall go on to the end. We shall fight and blah, 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 that we shall fight, you know, get us on the beaches, get us everywhere. And, and let's, and let's you know, hold our own. Um, anaphora, the only reason this speech works, because like the word shall is really stupid. Now there's a legal definition. There's, there's a legal, make sure you mute yourself. Make sure you mute yourself. Um, if you're not, just, I'm, I'm hearing, stuff so um but the, the the word shall doesn't really mean you know the the balrog in, in lord of the rings you know you shall not pass okay i guess i'll pass then right so we have this history of of let's go back to the bible of you know thou shalt not you know covet this and that and which means like yeah you can do it but you really shouldn't i, I would advise you against it but yeah you can that's what shall and shalt and the, you know, the ball you shouldn't pass i'll let you though that's sort of what it's saying and, and really until winston churchill we get into the 40s it's not just winston churchill it's douglas macarthur in 1942 did it uh, i came through and i shall return talking about an escape from the philippines really softening of the blow what you mean is you we will not you know, don't use shall. Shall is a soft word. That just means like, oh, I, maybe I shouldn't. That's all. That's all shall means outside of legal vernacular. Um, anaphora. Everyone knows this just by being alive. Once you know the dates of holidays, you know, like when, I don't know, Christmas and New Year's and Halloween and Valentine's, like barely know when Valentine's, I always get that and Groundhog Day mixed up. But it just by being alive, you know, this speech, I have a dream but then nobody knows what happens from there, right? Anaphora, blah, 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 Anaphora, blah, 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 Anaphora. Very few people can quote this whole thing. I have a dream that my four children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin. Very wonderful. Let's heal the nation. Let's begin the process. The nation isn't healed. But let's let's begin this, this very progressive process. But why is this speech remembered? because it was our articulate and, and the points he made. No, I have a dream. It, those, are the, those are the four words that everyone remembers. Anaphora is what made it effective. So Martin Luther King, he knew anaphora. He, like, if you're going to be effective in giving speeches, whether it's political, whether it's scientific, whether it's literature, you gotta know these things. You have to know these. Martin Luther King did, right? He didn't just go up and like, oh, let me just wing this. Now, maybe there was, he had some help with a speech writer. I have no idea um, if that's the case. But uh, a panelepsis, this is another one that is... Oh, it's sort of like 
a panalepsis is like extended diacopy. You begin and end with the same thing. So we're combining those last two. So not really, but it's it's a it's an extended um, diacopy. You know, <clears throat> the king is dead. Long live the king. The king is dead. Long live the king. A lie begets a lie. Now you can see where this is. This is sort of the same thing as Bond, James Bond, where it's where it's diacopy, dog eat dog, run Toto run, where, where we get into that same territory as it gets a little bit longer, and and you begin and end like the parentheses on on a sentence. You know, man's inhumanity to man, whatever. This is me sort of telling a student when the vestibular system is blah 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 blah, blah deterioration of the vestibular system. Like okay, that's bad writing, right? That's a panalepsis where it doesn't belong. Um, there are places where it does belong. And let's go with Shakespeare and all of his kings. And so King Lear, blow winds and crack your cheeks, rage, blow, right? So blow and blow. And and, and let's continue with, with some blows of, um, uh, you know, blood hath bought blood and blows have answered blows. That's King John that I quote all the time. It's like one of his worst um, uh, plays, but but it has like some of the, some of the best lines, and uh, Shakespeare in King Henry V, right? Once more into the breach, dear friends. Once more. So you can see how a panalepsis is sort of an extended diacopy. Super effective. Remember Bond, James Bond. Uh, Ian Fleming said, I came up with the most boring name in the English language. I could not come up with something more boring than James Bond. And yet that was number 22, some, somewhere around there, on this list of, of the greatest movie lines of all time. It's just a guy staying, saving his name, um, but using, using diacopy. A panalepsis is sort of a, an extended version of this. Now, tricolon, everyone needs to know this. Uh, if you're older than eight years old, you have to know the tricolon. Uh, effective communication is often ruined uh, by, by failure to incorporate the tricolon. And I mean, we're talking like Jackson 5, they knew this. Now, I don't know that they knew it was called a tricolon, but they knew everything comes in threes. Um, that's what a tricolon is. And so this is a young Michael Jackson. Um, the song is not A, B, easy as one, two, that would not have been a hit, right? A, B, C, easy as one, two, three. It has to have three. All of these things have to have three. It's a bird. It's Superman. That wouldn't work, right? It's a bird. It's a plane. It's a tricolon, right? It's a, it's a triplet. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. You have to have three. You can't stop at two. And Superman here, this is Action Comics. This is the cover of, of one of one of the comics. Um, obviously, a very old one with this sort of weird you know, sexism and and but he's eating like a let's call it a BLT, bacon, lettuce, and tomato. Is there meat in there? Yeah, but you can't say BLT and meat, whatever, because that's four. It has to be a BLT. You've already used your tricolon. You can't get to four. It gets awkward, right? It gets too awkward when you hit that that fourth. Um, but you can see some uh, like grammar errors here of, of you know, keep them coming or I'll starve to death. What do you think starve means? You know, I'll go hungry to death is essentially what, what starve means. And, but this, this, you know, there are three kinds of lies. Uh, he, this isn't his original quotation, but, but Mark Twain, it, he, he popularized this quotation. There are three kinds of lies, lies, damned lies, and statistics. It wouldn't have worked. This is a famous quotation. It would not have worked if he said, there are two kinds of lies, lies and statistics. That's not memorable, but damned lies has no purpose for being in here, only to support the tricolon. That's the only reason it's there. Um, Statue of Liberty, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. It's a tricolon. There's three of them. Give me your tired and your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. That wouldn't have worked. You needed poor in there as well. And when you end it, you have to end with the longest one. You always end with the longest one. Not always the longest one. It depends on where the words are in your mouth also, or if you're trying to set something up. Snap, crackle, and pop. Um, I-A-O, where you shape those words in your mouth. I is way back in your mouth. A is in the middle of your mouth. O is like on the way out. Like it's it's sort of falling out of your mouth. And so snap, crackle, pop. Like the pop is at the outside of your mouth by the time you're saying it. So, so it, it doesn't sound articulate if you, um, you know, why is it hip hop? Why, as opposed to hop hip? 
because you'd be going in if it were hop hip. You have to go out. It doesn't uh, like hop hip. It doesn't make any. That sounds ridiculous. Why? Because it has to be exiting your mouth. That's what makes it sound good. Um, and so it's either exiting your mouth or the last one is very long. Those are the those are the reasons uh, that we have. Uh, the sequence that, that you'll see on all of these. And I mean, but notice it's it's Huey, Dewey, and Louie. It's not like Huey, Dewey, Louie, and Stewie or whatever. Yeah, the three of them works. It's Goldilocks and the three bears. Um, any exceptions you can think of? Yeah, there are exceptions. Um, the horror, the horror. Um, you know, Joseph Conrad. Um, there are some exceptions. There are a few exceptions. So let's get into the list of non-exceptions, though. The truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. That's the long one, right? Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. You end with a long, you don't say the pursuit of happiness and life and liberty. You have to end with a long one. Unless the number of syllables is similar, then you end with the one that's at the outside of your mouth. Uh, mad, bad, and dangerous to know. Um, you know, the good, the, uh, the bad, the ugly. Friends, Romans, countrymen, lions, tigers, and bears, right? I, I, way in the back of your mouth, bears is, is, is the one that, that's going to end it. Um, now, blood, sweat, and tears, uh, this one was not originally blood, sweat, and tears. I think I have the exact quotation on, on the next slide. If I don't, I'll, I'll tell you what it means. But... Um, or what it is, but you know, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Lock, Sock, and Barrel, Lights, Camera, Action, Hook, Line, and Sinker, Shake, Rattle, and Roll, Rock, Paper, Scissors, Earth, Wind, and Fire. I, you just, I mean, Veni, Vidi, Vici, right? So this is um, Shakespeare, right? This is Julius Caesar, and you know, I came, I saw, I conquered. I saw doesn't belong in there. I came and conquered, but that's not memorable. That's not a line. Uh, Shakespeare knew the tricolon. Every, all literate writing with the, the, the tricolon, people know this stuff, location, location, location. And um, when we get to, um, to Epizuxis, which is now, okay, so, so Epizuxis is, is so that it, it, the blood, sweat, and tears. That is the, the, apparently I don't have that quotation in here, that is the expression that we all know. That wasn't the original expression. History has made it a tricolon because Winston Churchill had this like tetracolon where he said, um, nothing to offer but blood, toil, tears, and sweat. Okay, there are four examples there. Like that's stupid. Then I can't even remember. Like, no, but it's really dumb. You have to, you have to like really focus. And blood, sweat, and tears. Everybody knows that line. That wasn't even the line, but the human brain has just like you know what Churchill you got it wrong it has to be a tricolon it sounds stupid the way you said it and so we've reshaped it to be a tricolon blood sweat and tears the tricolon we have to we have to know this thing so when if you're coming up with an example you have to come up with three don't come up with two don't come up with four if you say location 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 you sound like a psychopath right there's there's weird uh brain issues going on here um, you know, in, in Walden, uh, you know, simplicity, 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 uh, Tony Blair, education, a lot of people have said this, education, 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 to, to promote it, but you don't say it twice, you don't say it four times, the real estate agent who says, you know, what's the most important thing about, about, um, uh, you know, real estate and, and sales, and stuff? Ed, uh, location, location, that sounds ridiculous, right? Location, location, location is ridiculous, but it works, right? Because of epizuxis is the repetition, but the tricolon, you need three of these things. And again, um, Shakespeare knew this stuff. Uh, Joseph Conrad, right? The horror, the horror, right? The two of them, it works, it's famous and, and it works, but but it actually came first in, in um uh, in Macbeth. And like an extended version of Epizuxis, if any of you have, have read or seen Fight Club, uh, you know, there are three rules of Fight Club or five, however many rules of Fight Club. Number one, we don't talk about Fight Club. Number two, you know, we don't you know, talk about Fight Club or where, where you just sort of repeat the same thing in, in, in different words. Um, analogy, not with an A analogy, like, you know, this, this sort of comparative version, you have to be really good to use, you know, analogy. Uh, and this is Elvis, you know, love me tender. Some people just have to fit it into verse. You mean love me tenderly, it should be an adverb. Uh, but Elvis got famous and, and I, do, I doubt he had any idea what he was doing. Let's go back to Joseph Conrad, um, the horror of the horror. Um, you know, Mr. Kurtz, he did, right? That's, that's a super famous line and deliberately altered. 
uh, to be memorable, to be quoted. Super famous line. Now Shakespeare, there's a lot of ridiculous lines in Shakespeare, and 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 but people's like, no, he did it. You know, that was on purpose. I'm like, I don't know. He ran a red light. You got to give him a ticket. You know, he didn't run a red light on purpose all the time. Um, Lord Byron referenced him earlier. Um, different con altering the tense. The tense. This is a famous one of altering the tense of, oh ye my people they, and then going back to some yees, right? So, so altering the tense in these sort of consecutive lines, um, you have to know what you're doing to do it. You can't just accidentally do it because then you just sort of, you're being made fun of if you do it by accident, but if you do it on purpose, now you have this, this effective way of altering speech in a memorable way. He broke to my nose. I don't know what that's from. I'm just reading the, the chat box. Um, but yeah, that, that, that would be a really good one. Uh, that would be a great one. He broke to my nose. Uh, I just, I don't know what that's from. The longest yard. Okay. So yeah, so that, that would be a, deliver, a deliberate one. Uh, so really great example. Really great example. That would be a deliberate one. And that you know the line. You know the line. He broke my nose. That's not memorable, right? So you use these literary devices. Um, these rhetorical uh, 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 tools and techniques. Um, and so parataxis and hypotaxis, all I want you to know with this one is when you're writing, now in the sciences, you wanna be a bit more paratactic in the sciences. So think Ernest Hemingway, you know, man ball fist, man punch other man, man blow up bridge, man kiss woman, ground quake, I mean, like Ernest Hemingway wrote like a four-year-old. And, but it was effective. It was very effective for what he was doing. I'm not saying he was a terrible writer. I think so, but I don't, I think that's a lot of my writing is um, appreciation is subjective. And where's Ernest Hemingway on my list of greatest writers of all time? Maybe three or four thousandth place. I don't think he was very good. But he's a great example of how to write uh, to communicate in a in a very clear ransom note like way, where you just get very specific, just just you know subject verb object period next. Um, so that's paratactic, and science tends to be like that. Now think if you're writing, let's say you're writing an action scene, you're doing fiction or something, um, or you're communicating in a way, you're, you're telling a story at the dinner table or at the bar, and you want the reader to have a a cardiac response, you know, this, this epinephrine response, an adrenal response, you do not want to speak hypotactically where you have these complex sentences. What you want to do is get in and get out of every sentence. And so if it's, read a, a book where there's a fight scene and it's parataxis, it's, it's, it's like, it's, it's like Hemingway gets punched, runs, gets shot, hi, you know, it's, it's sentence period, sentence period, sentence period. So the pacing of this, it's not this contemplative writing after the fight, afterward and so you can use this when you're telling a story you can use this in an interview if, if you're if you are explaining something where you want tension talk paratactically if you want movement if you want to if you want action if you want uh, if you want that type of emotion and if you want your communication to be contemplative be hypotactic okay i'm getting a crazy echo so make sure you're make sure you're muted um, but so, so contemplative writing is more, is more hypotactic and, and you can use both. There are strategies depending on what you want to communicate here. Uh, polysyndeton, asyndeton, this is just a matter of, of conjunctions. Um, when we're talking out loud, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're going to have a lot of, a lot of, um, uh, I mean, it just depends on, on the age and how you're, how you're communicating and, and, but we don't have these stop, you know, we just sort of join all, all sentences together and, and with these conjunctions, this and that and that and, and asyndeton is sort of no conjunctions, little kids don't, don't talk in this way. Um, a synecdoche, this can be used every once in a while, it's effective every once in a while, and you know, you know examples of synecdoches, you know, let's get some boots on the ground, nobody cares about boots, we care about soldiers, you know, that's like a military expression. Get some boots on the ground. I don't think the maybe the military leaders are saying it, but the politicians, uh, when talking about war, you know, in, we're in Afghanistan, we're in Iraq, we're in wherever, and we need some boots on the ground. Nobody cares. We just Nike isn't needed there. What's needed is bodies, and we're using boots to represent the body. And so, Helen of Troy, uh, you know, we, we're, we, is this the face that started this giant war, you know, the face that launched a thousand ships? Helen of Troy is more than a face, 
right? Uh, she's a person, um, but she's referred to as, as just a face here. And there are tons of these about hands, right? The hand that rocks the cradle. We're talking about the person, the person there. Um, you know, all hands on deck. It, it, it's not like severed hands, right? There are bodies. And so that's a synecdoche, very effective from time to time. And you will encounter it from time to other time. Um, transferred epithets are usually just... Um, they're often mistakes unless you use them deliberately, like dizzy heights and miserable mists. A mist can't be miserable. A person can be miserable in a mist. The mist doesn't have a nervous system. How is that miserable? Happy days. Days, that's not something that has emotion. A day, right? There are, there are days, those halcyon days of yesterday when we, we whatever. We, we get this idea of, of reflecting back on happier times or some happy days. No, we are happy and we are sad. Nights can't be lonely. People can be lonely. So that's what a transferred epithet is. Um, George R. R. Martin, who is a very talented writer, um, he's Song of Ice and Fire, Game of Thrones, um, everything. If you, if you read his, uh, his first book, Game of Thrones, not his first book, he wrote a ton of books before that, but the first book in that series, everything is nervous. It's like, oh, his grip is nervous. The, the sword is nervous. I mean, just everything is nervous all of the time. And that's a transferred epithet. And he does it to excess. Um, I think if you were to reread it today, again, a wonderful writer, if you were to reread it today, I think ah, it's a little bit too much nervousness of non-human beings. Now, uh, I'm going to wrap up for a couple of minutes on this subject. And I promise there's a real point that applies to your jobs and applies to your science, applies to your career, applies to your publications. There's a real point. This isn't Courtney goes on opinionated tangent moment. That's not what this is, but it's what it's going to look like for just a minute. So this is, you know, I, I love fantasy literature and there's a lot of like movies and stuff that just, ah, man, like I, I couldn't watch The Witcher. It's just the writing was too bad. And I was, I was, I tried a lot. Cause like this is has great actors and it's, it's a high budget and, and it's like right in there with the genre that I love. Ah, I just couldn't do it with the writing. And so I promise this is going to have a point in the end that's relevant. But so this would be my list of the top 10 <clears throat> fantasy uh, books of all time, the picture of Dorian Gray, Oscar Wilde, that's number one with a period after it. There is no number two. Um, I, I just, you can't, nothing is even close to it. Nothing is so close that it can draft it. Um, now, if, if the Hunchback of Notre Dame were just a little bit less description of, of like architecture and a little bit more magic, right? Then Victor Hugo, one of the great writers of all time, sure, I'd put him in number two. It's just not quite there, right? Having a hunchback in the, in the like the church bells, that's not enough. I'd say Princess Bride is number three. Shakespeare, among the most fantasy writers who has ever lived. Shakespeare is, it's historic. It's what people always argue me on, um, on this point, but it's historical fiction, sort of historical fiction in medieval Europe, right? Just most other, Evan Winter, uh, his is in sort of equatorial Africa. So that's sort of what, what makes his unique. Um, but, but Shakespeare, Scotland, right? It's, it is England. It's, it's, it's uh, Denmark and, and Italy. And, but there's just magic all over the place. I mean, Tempest, which is one of the, these are three of his most famous ones. Tempest, it's an imaginary land. That's what high fantasy means. If that's like Lord of the Rings, uh, Middle Earth, you invent your own land, right? It's not Scotland. You just invent your own place. And it's about a sorcerer in an imaginary land. That's what Tempest is about. But if you read, if you read like, oh, uh, Midsummer Night's Dream, right? Read that one. And there's a king and a queen of the fairies, right? You re read the rest of the work and there's spirits and, 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 and ghosts and there's changelings and, and nymphs. Right. I mean, you just there's there's witches, right? Macbeth, you know the witches. Um, there's goddesses. I mean, it's just it, this is like the, the, he out. He's more fantastic than Tolkien, and yet everybody with that says like, oh, Shakespeare is literature. It's histories and romances and comedies. What are you talking about? It's like wizards and witches and fairies and nymphs and, and magical lands and or even if it is in England it's it's like this you know quarreling kings and whatever I mean, it's the magical potions and stuff it's it's the most fantasy that there's ever been is Shakespeare now here's where this becomes a real point you should read whatever you're interested in in academia often people will frown upon things like fantasy and the hobbit is is Regardless, oh, it's a kid's book. And I would argue that C.S. Lewis actually is 
um, uh, for like eight year olds. And, and I've never, I can't get into C.S. Lewis, but, but there's other, you know, Tagana, um, BFG, if you've read that, Roald Dahl, eh, maybe that's in the fantasy domain. Wonderful, wonderful book. I would say like A Wrinkle in Time, Alice in Wonderland, we're getting a little bit more sci-fi certainly with with you know uh, a wrinkle in time um dracula frankenstein i mean there's there's a lot of historical entries here the fairy tales grimm's fairy tales things like that um but there's so much actual literature here and i put harry potter on my list of of legit literature mostly the sixth book is so well written and and drags up a lot of the um the the quality of of the series but read whatever you want there's there's nothing there's only good writing and bad writing that's all there is in life is it well written or is it poorly written that's what matters and all of this stuff tells you how to tell a story right how to to uh, phrase things in a memorable, effective, clear way, rising action and falling action, and how to set a hook and how to deliver on promises. Now, when I look at data, I look at raw data, I see um, an unexplored landscape. I say, I see high fantasy of a, a world that needs world building, that, that needs to be populated by uh, findings, right? And so, so then I start evaluating that landscape with things like bivariate correlations and t-tests and, and, and regressions. And I just see these mysteries waiting to be revealed, waiting to be written. And that's what research is. That's what science is, right? It's this marriage. It's the rational marriage of statistics and storytelling. That's what research is. So when people say, oh, I don't have time for fiction, these are people who don't have a, uh, an effective career usually because they don't understand how to write. They don't ex understand how to express their science. Um, now, maybe there are translators for them. There are really effective laboratory scientists who uh, can have other people do the translations, right? They can have, oh, uh, I don't know, all, you know, all of the um, sort of pop, whatever it is, David Epstein, right? The, the, the Sports Illustrated science writer, or this, that sort of category. Uh, Malcolm Gladwell may be the best of these, of these categories of, of translators, of communicators, but you need to be able to communicate too. You need to be able to um, uh, tell your future uh, audience what you found, why it's important. So if you go to ResearchGate, I like this site. It's maybe it's not the best of algorithms of how you quantify research impact, but here's me, right? Here's Nathaniel and Nathaniel, he is, or maybe he's on the call, I have no idea, but but uh, Nathaniel, he joined up in the research group. He was in 180 at one point. He now has 11 peer reviewed publications. We have these uh, abstracts in, in medicine and science and sports and exercise. Nathaniel knows how to tell a story. So here, come sit by my campfire let me tell you the story of rib fracture care of biomechanical advantages in baseball let me tell you the tale of fall risk prevention let me tell you the tale of this particular treatment outcome in physical therapy let me tell you the tale of uh annual oh <clears throat> thermal regulation parameters. That was one of, of Nathaniel's. And so it's, it's, that's science, right? And so the idea is, I want all of you to be able to express yourself well, write well, tell your scientific story. And maybe you can't read fiction right now, but there's no such thing as as like a frowned upon genre. I don't care what it is you're reading. If it's if it's well written, if it's well written, if it's articulate, if they know the the rhetorical devices and they and they know the structure of writing, you know how the acts work, and that's what you need to learn. But success for your future, success in life, you have to have the appropriate degree, right? That's where we started. You need to hit those minimum thresholds. You have to have the degree. Again, applying for a job, nobody cares the tiniest bit. Nobody will even ask. They'll never know what your GPA was. But do you have to have minimum GPA sort of to get um, into graduate school? Sort of. Nathaniel can just go anywhere he wants. Um, Cynthia Villalobos, of uh, those who, who know her, she had 30 uh, abstracts, and, and Yale flew her out to to uh interview on Yale's dollar um you know and so she she I think had accepted at at UC Davis for her PhD but 
um, you get a bunch of publications and, and what, is, what do people care about? Well, publications, right? Do you have the degree? All right, let's, let's talk about what else you have. Do you have effective communication and do you have scholarly contributions in your field? That's the stuff people look at. That's the stuff that advances your career. And, you know, behaviors that in my, and now I'm not saying worldwide, I'm not even saying nationwide or demographic wide, but in my analyses, in my quantitative and qualitative uh, perspective, uh, focusing on tests, will this be on the exam, is just going to damn you to, to a ridiculously long life devoid of professional satisfaction. That's not helpful in life. This stuff is going to advance your life. Um, this is like the fast pass Right. If you're if you're driving around in, in California, this stuff gets you. Um, you'll just start ascending uh, the the hierarchy, and whether it's a tax bracket or or you're in a hospital or clinical setting, and, and you, you'll just start ascending those ranks. Um, okay, let's do questions and answers. Uh, my my three part my tri colon of literacy is officially over. Um, what questions do we have? And I assume almost everything is going to be test oriented. Do we do we have questions? I'm trying to think of some right now. Okay, so let me let me just offer some some advice on what to do. I think it was lecture 22, and just interrupt me. I'm just going to talk for a few minutes, um, and interrupt me if questions come to you. Not don't come up with questions just like oh, I feel like I have to ask something, but if if you're generally um, wondering or worried about content area or or like man, I just don't understand like this particular thing, interrupt me because I'm just going to do a monologue of, of uh, you know, sort of stream of consciousness here. But the stuff that I think is going to be valuable, the test is mostly reading outputs, you know, t-tests, uh, independent samples t-tests. I'm not going to have you do paired samples t-tests. It's the easiest thing in the world, but, but paired samples t-tests, linear regression, logistic regression, bivariate correlations, and chi-squared and chi-squared tests. That's really, if you can read those outputs. So look at where those fall. Look at where th in, in the lectures, at the, right at the beginning of this lecture and the beginning of the last one, the one before that, it says, you know, lecture 16, lecture 17, lecture 18 at these minutes. If you read, th if you listen through those, rewatch those, that will be really helpful to interpret the statistics. And then beginning, I think it's at lecture 22, where I do scenarios. And there's a ton of them in the review slide. In the review slideshow, there, there's the PDF. There's a ton of these scenarios. There's a lot of scenarios on the test. Very similar. None of them are the exact same, but very similar scenarios on the test. They say stuff like, well, the type of setting is this, and the variables you have are this, and here's the question you want to know. It's multiple choice, and you have to decide, is it linear regression? Is it logistic regression? negative binomial regression. I'm not going to make you read negative binomial or Poisson outputs, but knowing a context for that one, uh, there may be one question that would incorporate that. And again, that's a count, right? That's a number of occurrences of something in a, in a given period. How many goals did you score in soccer in the course of a game? Or how many times did you relapse in the course of a month? Something like that, where there's a whole number, there's an integer, right? You're counting one, two, three, four and then like the sesame street guy chimes in um the vampire and uh, that would be a negative binomial or poisson regression uh you, linear regression again you know is is you have a continuous dependent variable and you're predicting you're predicting something the effect of this collection of predictors on some continuous dependent variable. Okay, we have a linear regression, a multiple linear regression. If it's the odds of something happening, an odds ratio that you're looking for, how likely is it that X is going to happen given you know, Y, Z, and, and you know, LMNOP variables? That's a logistic regression. We're looking at an odds ratio there. Um, if you have differences between two groups, right? differences between uh, males and females, differences between <clears throat> uh, athletes in basketball and athletes in soccer of some particular outcome. Now we're looking at either chi-squared 
or a t-test, an independent samples t-test, because these are two different samples. And oh, and ANOVAs, you have to, you have to know the ANOVAs too. Um, but two different samples. If it's continuous, if it's like height, let's say it's vertical jump height, the difference between basketball and what's another sport where people jump high? Volleyball. Basketball and volleyball. Is there a difference in vertical jump height? Um, okay, this is going to be an independent samples t-test because you have basketball over here, you have volleyball over here, and they're going to jump and you measure all those jumps in different people. And that's a continuous you know, dependent variable where you have, it's you know, 12.3 inches and, and 28.1 inches and 40 inches. We have a monster who can you know, dunk with their armpit or something. And, uh, but if it's something like basketball versus volleyball, do you have a scholarship? Yes or no? Chi-squared. That's a chi-squared test. Now, ANOVA, um, if we're going to do a, a t-test, but there's more than two groups, is group one, group two, group three, group four, group five, however many groups, three or more groups, now we're getting into ANOVAs. Um, and all we really talked about was sort of the paired samples t-test version, these repeated measures, ANOVAs. And um, one way, two way, mixed. One way is just you test them three times or four times or five times. And it's just a ton of t-tests, time point one versus time point two, time point one versus time point three, time point two versus time point three. Time point one versus time point four, time point two versus time point four, time point three versus time point. You get the idea. You ton of t tests all at once, but that's irresponsible um, to run a bunch of t tests and they're like, oh, we found some spurious correlation. Not helpful. Not helpful. Misleading. You want to be cautious. You want to write your stuff well. That's what I've been talking about for three straight lectures. Write your stuff really well, but also be ethical. Be ethical in your statistics. Be cautious in your statistics. And running ANOVAs uh, is a better way if you're going to look at multiple comparisons.